Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the September 22nd Metro Board meeting. Thank you for your patience as we got settled into a new space. Um, I'd like to ask for a roll call. Director Brown. Here. Director Downing. Here. Director Dutra. Director Kalantari Johnson. Present. Director Coney. Here. Director Lind. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Newsom. Present. Director Pagler. Here. Director Kittles Carter. Director Rockin. Here. Ex officio Director Henderson. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. And we have quorum. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to agenda item three announcements. Two announcements today. Um, today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And um, I believe I'll ask, we have language services. Is, is Maria Avila here? Oh, great. So we have um, Spanish interpretation services available, and I'll let Maria translate that. Hello, my name is Maria. I'm here for any uh, Spanish speaking interpretation uh, services. Uh, mi nombre es Maria, estoy aquí para los servicios de intérprete en español. Thank you for being here. Okay, item four is Board of Director comments. Please. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that America Walks, which is an organization, you can find them at americawalks.org, they're asking all of us to take the week without driving challenge. That's going to be October 2nd through the 8th. Uh, they're encouraging elected officials, public officials, transportation professionals, organizations, advocates, and individuals to participate in the National Week Without Driving so that those who have the option to drive regularly can understand the barriers and challenges that non-drivers face when trying to move safely in their communities. Um, there is a challenge. Your organization can take the challenge, or you can as an individual. And their website is americawalks.org. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board members have comments? Please. Um, thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Um, I attended the annual meeting of the Central Coast Community Energy and Pastor Robles last week, and uh, we have a lot of challenges ahead, uh, mainly about uh, ad resource adequacy in the grid, but uh, we are <clears throat> very pleased to be working with Metro, as we have, and we will continue to do so. I uh, just want to let you know that uh, Metro was brought up uh, and uh, in a very positive manner. So. Uh, we're trying to work, uh, Triple C E is trying to work, is working with Metro as best we can, and uh, I think it's a very positive arrangement. Thank you. Great, thank you for your work on that, Commission. Any other board members? Okay, uh, we'll move on to item five, which is oral and written communications. I will note that we've received written communication and it's in our packet. Uh, we also received some late uh, written communication that was emailed to board members and staff will respond. Uh, so this is an opportunity for members of the public to come up and speak about items that are not on the agenda, that are related to the Metro. Good day. Brian Peoples with Trail Now. We're a local organization supported by thousands of supporters. Um, we actually were a PAC for 2012, or 2016 Measure Ds for support. Um, our goal is to open the coastal corridor from Watsonville to Santa Cruz in a timely, cost-effective manner. Only 1.2 miles have been built in a decade, and we've had the funding. 12-foot-wide trail should not cost twice as much as widening Highway 1, which is the case. Clear-cutting hundreds of trees for a substandard 12-foot trail should not be done. We need to build the interim trail. Guy Preston from the RTC recommended years ago the interim trail, basically rail banking, because it was the fastest way, most economical way to build the trail. Unfortunately, board members from the Metro uh, did not support his, and he actually, they supported Roaring Camp. I was very disappointed with that, and I felt uh, sad for Guy's present that he was uh, not supported by this board because it made sense. Uh, Fifteen years ago, the RTC hired a consultant, the Woodside Group, 
that confirmed 15 years ago that they could rail bank. There are three primary corridors, SoCal, Highway 1, and the Coastal Corridor. All of them need to be open. And for us to keep, keep that Coastal Corridor closed for decades is wrong. We need to move forward. We need to get the, the misconception that the railroad tracks can't be pulled because we can't touch them. Guy Preston presented rail banking, the legality of it. It's the most cost-effective approach. And what's really disappointing is the economic loss to our community on the decades that we're sitting here not using that resource, the traffic congestion, the increased climate change, the economic benefits that we're missing that we do not have from opening that corridor. There's a simple plan. Communities do it across America, which is rail bank, pull the rails, and place the trail in. That doesn't mean you can't have a future transit. Doesn't mean you're not going to have a train. You have funding for a train study. But we need to open that corridor as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Others in public who would like to make? Thank you. Let me just ask, do we have a timer going? We have someone online. Okay, we'll go ahead and um, have your public comments, and then we'll go online. Uh, I just want to say in regards to the, his comments and stuff, as someone that uh, usually needs to use some mobility devices to get around, I would encourage that as you look at all options for the, for the rail trail and so on and so forth, you consider that. Me and my husband love the parts of the rail trail that are already open. We feel safer walking on those than on the sidewalk, to be honest with you, between down all like off Mission Street and so forth. And I will use it to go around town back there. Um, and just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Um, should consider uh, long-term costs, not just immediate costs. Thank you for your comments. OK, we'll go and take comments from those participating online. Okay, Th there's no one who wants to do public comment online. I misunderstood. No, okay. And we don't have participation online, period. Okay. All right, anyone here um, who wants to uh, give oral communication on items not on the agenda? Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Um, we will move to item six, labor organization communication. Good morning, Board of Directors. Uh, James Sandoval here, and I have a bittersweet announcement to make to you all. Uh, today will be the last day I address you as the General Chairperson of Smart Local 23, who represents all the bus drivers and paratransit drivers at Santa Cruz Metro. My last day at Metro will be September 29th, and Brandon Freeman will be, be slotting into my position. And uh, the reason is because I have been elevated into the International Vice President for my Union Smart Transportation Division. So, thank you. And I say it's bittersweet because I've been doing this for nearly five years, and you know I really care about everybody in this room. When I stepped in day one, you know it's always been my goal to bring that family feeling back to Metro. And I'll be honest with you, when I was elected, I don't feel like I didn't feel like that family feeling was there, and it was a goal of mine. I could remember the last time I was in this room having this board of directors meeting. It was a, it was a meeting that was pretty, pretty bad, and we were asking for the board's help. And thinking about the past and thinking about where we're at now, it's just amazing to see the progression that we made. And with everybody in this room, we are the reason why we're bringing that family feeling back. So I have extreme gratitude to every single one of you, all the managers, all the all of um, the bus drivers, all of the everybody, all the employees at Metro, and, and including all of you as the board of directors, we were able to be part of this. And I also want to give a big shout out to Michael Tree because of his leadership. We were able to bring us where we're at today, 
and beyond just his leadership, you know, the fact that he cares. That's that's what it really well, that's what really matters to get us where we need to be to have that family family feeling for Metro. And I feel like a lot of these people or everyone in this room really cares. And that's what it's going to take for us to keep going down this path, to keep that family feeling and keep bringing Metro together so we can provide an awesome transportation system for our community. So with that being said, I just want to thank you all. Thank you. Wait, don't go anywhere. Um, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge you, James. You lead with vision and compassion. Um, you've been a great leader for the Metro bus drivers. You've been a great facilitator of deep conversations. It's been a pleasure to work with you in my few years on the Metro board. Um, and I know that all of our paths will cross because you'll continue to do the great work in our community. And I'm looking forward to, and we're looking forward to working with you, Brandon, as you step into this leadership role. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning, I'm Dawn Creme, HR Director, and um, I'm not sure it's appropriate that I speak now, but I did want to speak after James because I want to publicly say thank you to James. Um, when he made, when he took the general chair um, position, it's right when I was made interim director, and so we were kind of like the blind leading the blind. And him and I sat down and had a meeting, and we were like, it was about a two-hour meeting, right? <laughs> it was like a two-hour meeting, and we talked about work and our personal stuff, and we shared stuff about our families, and we just said, you know what, we're gonna go into this knowing that we're not gonna always agree, um, but we are gonna have the utmost respect for each other. And the end goal is to make sure that Metro is successful. And so thank you because I think we've always been able to do that, right? I mean, we've always had tremendous respect. We haven't always agreed, um, but it's just been a pleasure and I wanna say thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Good morning. Hello, board. My name. Uh, my name is Jordan Vasconis, uh, SEA chapter president for SEIU. I just want to also um, give some kind words to James. I just want to express um, my gratitude toward him and, and um, his leadership uh, has inspired me to kind of um, kind of take on my own personality as he kind of took on his own personality. And um, I just want to also say that um, because of James, we were able to um, establish solidarity across the two unions that didn't formally exist. So I think that is worth its weight in gold. So thank you, James. You uh, definitely are going to kick ass at, uh, <laughs> at your next position. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. All right. Okay. Thank you. And again, thank you, James, for all of your years of service. Um, we are moving on to item seven. Are there additional documentation to support existing agenda items? No. There are not, okay. Then we are moving to consent agenda. That's items 8.1 .1 and 8.8, .8, and we will take that all in one motion um, unless something is pulled. So let me just see if any item needs to be pulled or if there are any comments. Okay, I'll take it out to public comment. All right, I'll bring it back we'll for motion. Over consent agenda. Okay. Second. All right. Um, I think we can just do, we don't need to do roll call, do we? Okay, so all in favor, aye. say aye. aye. Okay, any nays? Any abstentions? All right, that passes. Give the maker of the motion a second to get ready. I'm sorry? You announced the vote, you should, for the oh, thank purpose you. of the person trying to take minutes. Thank you. They say who made maker the motion. Maker of the motion was Rotkin, second Pegler. Pegler. Thank you for that reminder. All right, moving on to our regular agenda, we have um, item nine, which is presentation of employee longevity awards. Um, so I will go ahead and read the names, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any of your names. If you are here, please come and step up. Um, so we have 10 years, uh, Eduardo Bibriesca, David Hernandez, Johnny Lopez, Edgardo Madrigal, Ignacio Mata, Lisette Mendoza Garcia, Juan Montesino Zarate, Amy Perez, and Romeo Vidal. Oh, you are all here. Look at, there's many of you here. Wonderful. Please come up. Um, thank you for your decade of service here. Uh, we appreciate all that you do. And if you have a couple of words, I invite you to speak the opportunity. Thank you. All right, well, let's give a round of applause.
do have certificates for you. And we do have, we do have um, someone who's been here for 35 years, Angel, Angel Valdez. Are you here, Angel? Okay, well, let's give a round of applause for Angel for his 35 years. Okay, we're on item 10, safety certificates of achievement presentation for the fourth quarter ending June 30th, 2023. Um, I will invite Margo, Margo Ross. Uh, good morning, everybody. Margo morning. Ross, Chief Operations Officer. Um, for the last 90 days, we've had the transit supervisors, the safety and training department, and the dispatchers. Um, they have um, follow the five tenements of FTA. Uh, they follow the safety policy, safety risk management, safety assurance, and safety promotion. Um, they've had no accidents or incidents in these last 90 days, so um, hopefully we'll award them and applaud them. And thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we are on item 11, consideration of author authorizing the use of the California Department of General Services contract for purchase of 48 40-foot fuel cell electric buses and authorizing the use of the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services contract for the purchase of nine 60-foot fuel cell electric buses from the New Flyer of America, Inc. Juan DeMuth, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, good morning, board members, staff, and guests. Uh, my name is Wendy Mumangstu, Metro's Capital Planning and Grants Program Management. Uh, I'm here today to ask the board to authorize uh, the use of the Californian Department of General Service contract to purchase 48 uh, 40 foot hydrogen fuel cell bus and uh, the Washington State Department of Enterprise Service contract to purchase nine articulated bus and award uh, contract to New Flyer America in, uh, in a combined amount of not to exceed 80. Uh, seven million four hundred twenty-seven, three hundred nine thousand uh, three hundred three hundred nine point zero eight cents, and authorize the CEO to execute uh, the contract with New Flyer, using these two uh, contracts. Uh, this board uh, submitted Metro Zero uh, Zero Bus um, rollout plan uh, on of January 27, uh, 2023, and Metro submitted this uh, rollout plan to. Uh, California Air Resource Board uh, around March, and our rollout plan was approved by uh, CARB the same month. Uh, the rollout plan had uh, three uh, goals. The first goal is to deploy uh, pilot uh, zero emission bus in Watsonville, which we did in back in 2021. And the second phase is to convert our entire fleet serving Watsonville area to zero emission by 2027, and also build uh, hydrogen fuel, uh, fueling station and also including charging infrastructure for the for uh, electric buses. Uh, our third goal is, our third phase is to convert our entire fleet to zero emission by 2037. So to achieve these three goals over the last uh, five months, we have been applying for multiple grant applications from state and federal grants. And in, as, you, as you know, in April we received uh, roughly 38.6 million in California State Transportation Agencies uh, Transit and Intercity Rail uh, Program. Thank you. And in July, we also received roughly 20.4 million from uh, Federal Transit uh, Assistance 
uh, bus and bus facilities program. Uh, we also received roughly uh, 4.8 million from uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation's multi uh, multimodal project discretionary grant. Uh, we we partnered with multiple uh, agencies and, uh, and third parties to apply for this uh, uh, grant application. For example, Nif Fly was named as a manufacturer in the grant application. Uh, we also named uh, CTE, Center for Transportation and Environment, as for project management. And we also named uh, Mesa Group for the construction of uh, hydrogen fueling station. So this is largely a partnership. Uh, it was uh, largely a, a partnership program. And we, in the grant application, we also said we would be using the state contract, uh, the state contract, because the use of state contract will take advantage of the procurement method that reduces customization, uh, making this project more efficient and cost effective. So, based on uh, New Flyers' uh, timeline, uh, we expect the delivery of these buses by the fourth quarter of uh, 2024 uh, for for the 40 footers, and uh, uh, by quarter one of 2025 for the articulated buses. So uh, as you know, as you all know, three years ago, roughly 62% of our fleet were beyond the full life. And now we are purchasing, with your approval, we are purchasing 57 buses, which will take, uh, which not only replace these buses, but also we are replacing these buses with zero emission buses. So this is tremendous achievement, uh, given where we were uh, three years ago. Uh, so, uh, uh, the purchase of these buses roughly going to reduce uh, 1.1 uh, million metric ton of uh, carbon emission. And uh, today, uh, contingent on the award, funds, uh, award of funds from VW, I'm asking the board to authorize the use of these two contracts, using these two contracts to purchase roughly uh, uh, 57 buses, and award co two contracts to New Flyer. Uh, New Flyer America in a combined amount not to exceed 87 million four hundred twenty-seven three hundred nine thousand dollars authorizing the CEO and general manager to execute the contract with New Flyer of uh, America utilizing two uh, these two contracts and happy I'm happy to answer any question thank you for your presentation and thank you for all the work to get us here um, let me see if there are any questions by board members Yes, please. I'm just wondering, um, in working with New Flyer, will you be able to determine where the buses are actually built in the Minnesota plant or the Canadian uh, plants? Or? Alabama, yeah. Yes. Minnesota? Alabama. Alabama? Yes, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Please. And I noticed um, in the Sentinel, it was a nice article on um, the $106 million deal for fueling hydrogen vehicles. But I also noticed there is... Um, some pushback on that and about the charging stations and things. Um, it was nice to see Metro acknowledged for the largest purchase nationally, so um, kudos. Thank you. But um, did you have a response on some of the concerns for the hydrogen fueling stations? Yeah, I mean, we, I know we, we, we have extensively uh, uh, worked with our partners, especially when it comes to our uh, zero emission rollout plan, we tested electric buses, battery electric bus. We already have 10% of our fleet are already battery electric bus. And so uh, we, we did a route analysis using those, te those technology. And so mm -hmm. we believe that the hydrogen fuel cell technology best, will best serve our routes given the topography of route. Uh, also, in terms of the fueling, I, I guess you know, the federal government has allocated roughly eight billion, eight billion dollar nationwide to support that supply chain when it comes to providing that fuel. And also, the governor is roughly allocating 1.1 billion for uh, the construction of a hydrogen fuel station uh, nationwide, uh, statewide. So we feel very comfortable when it comes to uh, uh, getting those fuels to uh, our agency coming five years so we, we certainly a lot of grant support and you know that supports and you know wonderful for us to have too yes thank you thank you thank you, thank you. director Atkin. i just wanted to, <coughs> to add that <coughs> at our last meeting we had pretty good presentation on uh, the prospects for um 
getting adequate hydrogen fuel uh, service. It, it is an issue. I mean, we shouldn't fool ourselves that there's not some risk involved here because there are not currently enough hydrogen uh, stations to sort of service all of our needs. But the presentation that we got from a number of groups that are working on that project suggests that both the, the availability of fuel and the cost of that fuel, which is pretty high right now, mm -hmm. should come down reasonably. Um, we got a um, comment at our last meeting from a member of the public, I think somebody from the Electric Vehicle Association of Monterey, Santa Cruz County, um, that basically, you know, we were just, we were depending on something that requires uh, fossil fuels to create. In other words, you have, how do you, how do you get this hydrogen? You put, basically, you put energy into water and it splits the molecules apart and gives you hydrogen and oxygen. And she was correct in her comments that um, at the current time, there's an awful lot of dependence on fossil fuels to create this hydrogen. But the exact same thing is true of people who are driving around in their individual um, electric cars. Uh, where does that electricity come from? If they're getting it from a solar system, then fine. It, it's, you know, and if, even that's not perfect because there's issues about where the lithium comes from and everything else that's very complex. But I, I, I was pretty confident after our last meeting that we're not taking that big a risk in moving it forward with hydrogen and that basically the fuel will be available for us when we need it. Yeah, thank you. Other comments or questions? Please. I just had uh, one comment. So you're doing two things historic today. The 57 bus purchases, as you had mentioned, the largest in North America thus far. And then with the nine hydrogen articulated buses, that will be the largest fleet of articulated buses in the nation running on hydrogen. Wow. Thank you for explicitly naming that for us. Great. Okay, um, I will see if there's anyone who has public comment on this item, item 11. Eduardo Montesino, you, you, you should be celebrating. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you know, the last time that there was a big purchase of Santa Cruz Metro, I think uh, the only one was here is Michael Rock in, in 98, um, and when, when we had the 98s, and we, we were coming up to um, an anniversary for one of those 98s that's a million miles, mm -hmm. you know, so um, that just calls the, uh, how the, uh, the maintenance department ha does a really good job. But like I said, this is, uh, you know, a historic for us since, like I said, the uh, one of the, uh, the last purchase was in 98, so this is a new day. So I would urge you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go take another public comment. Good morning. My name is Beverly Deshaux. I am a volunteer for the uh, Electric Auto Association of the Central Coast and have been for 16 years now. As a complete volunteer, using my own time just to promote what is best. Um, hydrogen uh, is 95% natural gas. They have not gotten to where it's anything beyond that natural gas. 75% um, of natural gas is methane, uh, which has a heating capacity in the environment of 120 to 80 times that of CO2. Um, in order to make hydrogen, um, it's necessary to, or when you have it in the vehicle, it's necessary to com compress it or freeze it in order to ship it, be shipped over our roads it is highly explosive. Um, and, and, has, and leaks because it's a very small molecule. The charging stations, I don't know if you've gotten quotes yet for how much the charging stations are. They're between 1.9 million to 4 million to 20 million. I've heard all of those price ranges. That is cost prohibitive. Um, When you have hydrogen, you have to, when you have a hydrogen vehicle, you must compress it uh, in order to ship it, compress it or freeze it in order to ship it. It's very costly. I don't know if you've been given 
uh, cost quotes here for the, for the infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> so you for, oh, I didn't know I was on a time limit. Anyway. Um, Why don't you finish your sentence, please? Okay. The, the fossil fuel industry is behind this. It's, pro, it's trying to prolong uh, them being in existence. This is not a good idea. It's not a good idea at all. I can give you more information about that, but it is a boondoggle, basically, um, led by the fossil fuel industry to stay in the game. So thank you thank for your you. comments. Thank you. So this timer, I just want to, uh, the timer is on three minutes right now. Is that correct? Two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Matt Farrell. I'm speaking for myself today, and I just want to uh, thank the Transit District and the Regional Transportation for this their collaborative work on this grant. I think that um, in in terms of heavy vehicles, my understanding that my understanding is that hydrogen represents a real advantage because the vehicle is much lighter with all the without all the batteries that are required to create ranges for buses that would demand, you know, the service capacity for some of the routes you're running and also the grade changes that you're looking at in serving places like the university. And I was really encouraged that Supervisor McPherson was talking about collaboration between CCE and the transit district on working on uh, this issue and uh, I wish them the best in collaborating on that and I uh, agree with Eduardo that 25 years of waiting to replace the fleet is just too long so I urge you to move forward and thank you to both agencies for all this work. Thank you. My name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos and I uh, First, just want to say how excited I am about this opportunity and this purchase. It's it's historic. It's crazy. And for our small little county to be replacing more than half of its buses in one fell swoop, it's just so encouraging. Um, I'm uh, my my background is uh, in architecture and and industry and, uh, and the trades, and then architecture and then education. I'm uh, I was a principal in in the the uh, Coast Futura streetcar demonstration that you might have ridden or remember. And I'm the state director for the National Energy Education Development Project. I work with PG&E and other uh, utility providers in educational programs. Um, I'm considered a subject matter expert in energy generation, conservation, and renewable energy. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that hydrogen should be so maligned because if we went back 20 years to electric vehicles, we'd be looking at lead acid batteries. The truth is that hydrogen generation technologies are advancing. There are countless uh, copper chlorine production, thermochemical electrolysis, uh, and the Rocky Mountain Institute, not known as a fossil fuel organization, has, has, in, has, has considerable materials on this. So uh, we're, we're, maybe we're getting hydrogen buses before we've worked out the technology to get absolutely green hydrogen, but that we're moving in that direction. The energy density of hydrogen as a fuel and the capacity for these buses to serve longer hours and take hills and so forth, and to be able to be available during uh, natural disasters is significant. So I hope we'll see a unanimous support for this purchase, and then we'll just move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make a comment on this item? Um, I just would like to encourage you all to really think about what the layout of the buses as you buy them. Um, just because a bus is ADA compliant doesn't mean it's easy for somebody in a wheelchair to use. As a current example, the buses that you got in like 2021 or 2022 that you got from VTA that came with the um, clear door at the driver's door, those are really difficult to get the wheelchair onto. The turn is so tight. 
and it's, it's, it's like it's barely ADA compliant to get on there, and that just makes it a little more difficult. And some of the, I think they're electric buses that have the environmental wraps on them. A lot of those buses, only the very top little window opens. And one of the things we learned from the pandemic is that fresh air is good for the health. So I, I know I and I know a lot of other people kind of don't like that aspect of the buses. Thank you. OK, anyone else? Good morning, Brandon Freeman, I guess, chairperson of Smart Local 23. Um, I'm going to keep it short because I think I made myself in my position pretty clear last board meeting. Um, hydrogen is the future. Um, but when we're talking about the cost and things, I don't think that you should worry too, too much about the cost. Because if you wanted to go battery electric, remember, we need a new operations building to do that. Um, we are maxed out on our charging capacity at our current location. We don't have another location to move to. I don't think you're going to build an overhead electrical array over that entire operations yard. So as far as cost, this is actually probably the more cost efficient option is to go with hydrogen because we can actually fuel the buses in that way. Um, as far as the last thing kind of unrelated was the windows. Um, the windows are designed that way intentionally because of the HVAC systems that are on board specifically to take care of things like COVID that are airborne. So fresh air is not always better. We do have a system in place to take care of that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think with that, I will bring it back to the board. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to put my party hat on here a little bit, as was suggested by Mayor Montesino. Uh, you know, when, will you, will you make a motion? Oh, I, I will, yes, I will move that we approve the recommendation here. <laughs> okay, I'll second. I'll second. Either way. Okay, I got it. All right, all right. And Go ahead and make your comments, please. Um, yeah, as was mentioned by uh, Mayor Montesino, when I joined this agency a few years ago, this was just such a huge looming problem that 60% of our fleet was beyond its useful lifespan. And, and we really didn't have a clear idea of how we were going to solve this problem. Uh, and then we bought, brought on CEO Michael Tree. Uh, he brought some vision for how we could uh, move towards hydrogen uh, and, and electric buses as well, of course, uh, and begin to solve this problem. I think we also need to thank uh, our grants director, Wanda Menjitsu, sorry, Menjistu, uh, for really pulling a rabbit out of a hat here. Um, you know, we went after these sta this bucket of state funds, the TERSIP funds, in a way that this agency never has before, and really knocked it out of the park. Um, I know that it was a team effort uh, with you, Chair, with Mayor Montesino, uh, with um, our uh, all of our regular employees. I also want to thank uh, the executive director of our Regional Transportation Commission, Guy Preston, who went up to Sacramento with me, uh, and we talked to uh, the folks at CalSTA and um, you know, really sold them on the, our vision for a sustainable transit system here in our county and how it was going to work together with our plan to build more housing in a, in a sustainable way. I mean, I think that's what's really most exciting here is we know we have a housing crisis, and the only way that we're going to be able to build the housing we need in this community is with a sustainable transit network for people to get around as well. You know, so I know we've heard com uh, some concerns from, from various members of the public about hydrogen uh, and the energy that it takes to produce it. Uh, I've received a number of concerns from the community as well. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately, as we, we really need to break up the sustainability problem uh, into discrete and solvable pieces. We need to have sustainable, non-emitting transportation, and then we need to look at how we can produce that, the energy that's needed for it sustainably as well. And uh, this obviously is a, a huge step forward for uh, the transportation piece of the puzzle. This is going to define the shape of sustainable transit in our county for a generation. It's really excited to, exciting to see it take place, uh, and I couldn't be more thrilled. So thanks. Go team. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Just to, to tag on, because I agree completely with you, and to take it further back, when I joined Metro several years ago, I was trying to think how long, but quite a while, probably 10 years ago, um, we needed 60 buses, and we didn't see how we could accomplish that. And it was just a continuing year-to-year 
um, actually, you know, desperation in how are we going to, to replace these buses and to see what's been accomplished this, you know, this past year and a half, two years is amazing. And um, I'm proud of all the work that Metro, all of you have done and uh, just agree completely with uh, Mono. Thank you. Other comments? Okay, yeah, I won't repeat what my colleagues have said. They said it beautifully. Um, so we will take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that passes with the maker of the motion being Director Koenig and the second being Vice Chair Brown. Did I get it? <laughs> okay, wonderful, congratulations. Um, we are moving to item 12 which is public hearing to receive public comments on the proposed disadvantaged business enterprise goal of 0% for federally funded procurements for federal fiscal year FY's 24 to 26. Chuck Farmer. Hello, before I let people make comments, if they have any comments, I just wanted to <clears throat> say that for each three years, we gotta go in and for any federally funded project, so keep that in mind, we're setting our target for zero, and the reason why we're setting it at zero is we only, at least our vision for the next three years, is to buy buses, and the buses are not DBE. So if that's really where the focus of the funding of federal funds, then we might as well set it at zero because we're not gonna be getting any DBEs. So that's the sole purpose, and before this meeting, we've actually had two reach out events uh, events, over 120 different companies, DBE companies, and we had attendees, and they were very appreciative. We, we reached out to them and got really good positive feedback. But because we're talking about just the federally funded projects, this is zero. So um, I just want to be clear on that. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I'll open it up to the public. Yes, my name is Antonio Rios from the city of Watsonville. One of the questions that I have mainly is our, our senior citizens. Um, I think we need more routes for our senior citizens in the city of Watsonville, along with the students that go from Watsonville to Carrillo College. Another idea that I have is um, this. One moment. I think, I think you are wanting to comment on the next item. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Coming soon. Coming soon. Hang tight. Thank you. Director Rodkin. I just want to say that since my early days on the city council, and that's a long time ago, I, I've been frustrated by the fact that we aren't able to come up with a higher percentage of um, uh, required contracts coming from the minority or disadvantaged uh, uh, communities. And after years of working on this issue, it really comes down to a practical question. Are there firms available to provide this? And the thing is, if you set yourself a goal that you don't meet, then you're in really big trouble. So you need to be realistic in setting this goal. And as was pointed out um, by Chuck Farmer, our, our, C, our uh, financial director, they, we're gonna be buying federal buses from Alabama or wherever it is and stuff. And we, we're not putting this out to the local community and trying to find if there's some small struggling uh, beginning businesses that could use our help at getting a contract or something like that. And so it's, I, I always reluctantly vote for these things because it's just, it is, on some level, it's, it seems like an embarrassment to vote for a, zero, a goal of 0%. We're not going to do anything. But I don't really think there's an alternative to it. And you have to be practical. I don't want to find ourselves in a fight with the federal government over some, a goal that we couldn't possibly meet, if, no matter how much we tried or something. So I'll be happy to move for approval of this item. We have a motion. I won't be happy. I'll be unhappy to move approval yeah. of this item. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. OK. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we have first by Rotkin, second by Koenig. Thank you. 
Okay, we are now moving to item 13, and that is the public <coughs> hearing to receive public comments on the proposed reimagined Metro Phase 1 service proposals for the implementation in December 2023. Um, John Ergo, welcome. Good morning, directors. John Ergo, uh, Planning and Development Director. So in a moment, I'm going to turn the podium over to Jarrett Walker, who's wandering in the back there, great, uh, who's going to lead us through a presentation <coughs> of the Reimagined Metro Phase 1 service proposal, which if the board adopts today will be implemented in December. Uh, but first, I'd like to briefly recap how we got here. So last October, uh, we all met, or most of us anyway, at a board retreat where we laid out three very ambitious goals for Santa Cruz Metro. Double ridership in five years to levels not seen since the mid-2000s, never buy another bus with a tailpipe, and maximize the development of affordable housing at our transit centers. All three goals are, of course, interrelated and supportive of each other, and all are in service, I think, of a singular vision where Metro really strives to be the best community partner it can be to ensure that Santa Cruz County is livable, equitable, and sustainable. If the past few years of the pandemic were somewhat of a nightmare, uh, then I think the current moment feels like a dream that you don't want to wake up from. In the past six months, we've secured funding to complete the redevelopment of Pacific Station, which with our city partners is scheduled to break ground uh, in February. We're well on our way to securing the funding we need to redevelop the Watsonville Transit Center into an affordable housing development and transit center, and we've just heard about the historic purchase order for 57 zero emission hydrogen fuel cell buses in six months. In my mind, the service changes we're asking you to consider adopting today are no less historic because they begin to reverse the reductions in service this community has seen since 2016 and really over the last two decades. Uh, they also set the stage for the service expansion plan uh, that we will bring back to you for your consideration in under phase two. This has really been a group effort. We've worked not just with Metro staff internally, but our partners at the cities of Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Scotts Valley, and Capitola, as well as with the county, as well as with our bus operators, smart representatives. Uh, and in April, we held a three-day design charrette where we worked to develop uh, the draft proposals that we brought to you first in June. Taken together, the phase one and phase two proposals uh, aim to create a transit system that is fast, frequent, and reliable, that responds to community concerns, and one in which uh, transforms riding Metro uh, into a matter of convenience and self-interest rather than self-sacrifice. The whole notion that we could even consider increasing service was given life uh, by our bus operators, particularly particularly by the concerted efforts uh, in recent months to recruit, hire, and train new operators. Uh, something I think like a third of our operators uh, currently have been hired in the past year or two. Uh, so give them a break as we welcome them into the family. But it's, it's really been uh, a staggering turnaround of the past couple of years. So in short, uh, Metro is on a roll, literally and figuratively, and with your support, we plan to continue that momentum. So I'd like to invite uh, Jarrett Walker to present uh, the phase one proposals and I'd like to suggest a point of order if it's appropriate that we at the end of the phase one uh, Proposal we hold a public hearing before we roll into the presentation of phase two So I think we'll pause at that point if that if that makes sense Good morning. Thank Good morning. you very much for the opportunity. This has been one of the most exciting projects my firm has worked on in a long time. <clears throat> we work for so many transit agencies who are trying to figure out how to downscale, trying to figure out how to do less with less. And it's really exciting to have a chance to work with a transit agent, with a transit agency and with a community that really wants transit to have a larger role and is ready to make that happen. So we imagine Metro is specifically about re-envisioning where buses should go and how often, so the design and scheduling of the network. The key goals include increasing the overall amount of service provided, making transit more reliable and relevant to the community's needs, adapting, of course, to post-COVID tra travel patterns, and creating a network that's useful and attractive for many people's trips. 
We're planning changes to the network that would come into service in three phases. Phase one, right away, December 2023, as fast as possible, with the operating resources that will be available by the end of this year. And that's the phase that you will need to make a decision about today if it's going to happen in December. Today's the last opportunity to approve it, to keep that schedule. So we'll, most of my presentation will be about phase one and how we got to phase one, because of course that's the thing that I need you to really understand in the most detail so you can decide whether to approve it. Then afterward, as John mentioned, after the public hearing, I'll give you what's more of a sneak preview of, of early thinking about what phase two and phase three might look like as the network continues to grow with certain assumptions about resources and staffing that seem reasonable. So where we are now, we've been through a process of analyzing the network. We uh, went through a process of developing a couple of alternatives for phase one and ran them past the community in the community input process. We got back their feedback, and that was the basis then for the final design of phase one that's before you. From here, we bifurcate into two tracks. Phase one, if you choose to approve it today, goes very rapidly into implementation, preparing schedules, training drivers, all of that, to get onto the street by December 23. Phase two and three go onto their own track of further refinement and another round of community input on the design to get to, until we get to the point where those are ready for your approval for implementation. <coughs> so what we're doing today is presenting that feedback, presenting phase one, and then also previewing phases three and four. So let's review the conversation we had this summer. At the time, what we were looking at was the possibility of adding about 10% in service above the current level at that time. And what we sought was to, were to come up with simpler and more direct routes, higher frequency, better transfers, and in some areas there were going to be some changes in which streets had bus service, and I'll take you through detail of that. Here's the existing metro network as it is today. Now please remember in every map that we draw, the colors are indicating all day frequency, how often the bus comes. The dark blue on these maps is a bus every 30 minutes. The light blue on these maps is a bus every 60 minutes. Purple on these maps is a bus every 20 minutes, and red on these maps is a bus every 15 minutes, and you will note there is no purple or red on the map today. Alternative one, which was a lean toward frequency, um, had a series of choices in it that had, a, had less service to certain places in order to build up higher frequencies. So for example, over here in Santa Cruz, service was removed on High Street to pay for consistent high frequencies on both 18 and 19, the two main paths to the university. Over here, service was removed through Twin Lakes um, to have a consistent 30-minute pattern here. Several similar choices going through, and I'll, I'll explain those. Um, both alternatives reflected the operating constraints of 145 drivers by December and no new infrastructure except for the temporary closure of Pacific Station and the, um, um, you know how to go back? There we go. There we go, there we go, that's what I wanted. So alternative B, which was a lean toward coverage, looked very similar but in various specific spots we had different choices that reflected greater emphasis on getting close to people, but at the expense of frequency. So for example, here we have service on High Street, but on the other hand, the 19 corridor, which is Bay Street and the boardwalk to the university was only every 30 instead of every 15. We have a split in here where you see the service in Live Oak coming apart into hourly branches in order to cover more area and so on. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Excellent. Okay, good. So both alternatives would provide similar overall coverage to the network. Alternative B 
provided service near slightly more people, alternative A, by virtue of being more frequent, was more useful in getting more people to destinations, but, not, but, but there were individual areas that it wasn't going to serve, and the people in those areas weren't going to like it. So we had a public conversation about those, quite an extensive one, an online public, on, online public meetings that about 90 people in total attended, stakeholder conversations with about 20 organizations, Writer focus groups with about 30 writers from about the, throughout the service area, including one focus group in Spanish. In-person outreach, three events in Watsonville, one in Live Oak. In-person outreach is a thing that we do specifically targeted to demographic groups that tend not to respond to other forms of outreach. So that was like going to the transit center in Watsonville and actually talking to people that you met there, for example, in English and Spanish. Um, an online survey, the online survey these days is always where we get the, the bulk of the feedback, 789 responses online, plus 15 people who did a paper version of the same questionnaire that got coded the same way. And finally, a project website that saw about 1,500 unique visitors over the course of the outreach period this summer. The high-level takeaways, there's very positive response to increased frequency, Positive responses to the simplified pattern of service, especially the dramatic simplification of service that's proposed for Watsonville. And I'll, go, I'll get into that in a little more detail. Cons there was lots of concern over the potential loss of service on High Street. There was a lot of desire to see a return of the Watsonville Santa Cruz Express bus, the 91X, which, was not pr which we were not proposing in the, in the alternatives. Um, and there were a lot of questions about how major service changes will be communicated. The um, survey results overall reflect a diversity of county residents and metro riders. Among those who reported their demographic information, a little over half were regular metro riders. 45% identified as people of color, including 30% uh, Latino or Latina. 40% um, low income, 40% not owning a car. 28% identifying as students of UCSC or Cabrillo, and 15% identifying a disability that limits mobility. So obviously a demographic slice that is more representative of the ridership than it is of the entire population, but also with a significant number of people from the general population. 48% were not metro riders, but were nevertheless interested enough to take the survey. And I think that's very encouraging. We asked, do you agree that metro service, where and how often the bus should come, needs to change? There are very few defenders of the existing system as it is. <laughs> At a ver so at the high level, um, so then we asked, um, uh, then we presented the changes at a very high level, just describing the general ideas like is listed here, um, and that we're proposing to make more, to, to a 10% increase in service, that we're proposing higher frequency in areas with higher demand, that we're proposing simpler service with more direct routes, better transfers with shorter waits and no second fare, but that to make this possible, We'd need to change some route numbers and names, and in some areas we might change which streets have bus service. So in response to that kind of high level of description, not explaining exactly who was going to be affected how, there was an overwhelming feeling that generally those principles sounded like a good idea. Obviously, responses will differ once we start looking at maps and see exactly what the effects are. We asked people generally about which improvements were most important to them, and overwhelmingly, 56% said higher frequency wherever possible. 34% uh, then specifically mentioned the Watsonville Santa Cruz Express service. 33% su um, suggested weekend service levels matching weekday service levels. 29% suggested more frequent service on 17 to San Jose. 29% more service in the evening. 23% direct service between UCSC and the east side of Santa Cruz and Live Oak. 29% something else. So these were, these were prompts. Uh, we, we prompted people with a whole series of different possible general kinds of improvements, and the responses came back this way. And I'm pleased to say that by the time we get to phase three of the plan, all of these things will be in there. Unfortunately, they aren't all in phase one. It's not all affordable immediately. But um, everything on this list is something that the agency is interested in getting to. So based on that, we took all that feedback back. We had a bunch of intensive meetings, and we you know, stared at, at the maps a lot and um, stared at a lot of twists and turns and came up with these recommendations. So 
Updated parameters. The good news is hiring has gone faster than we anticipated at the time that we drew the alternatives, and as a result, we can put out a little more service than we expected at that time, which means that some of the painful trade-offs that we were asking the public about in the, this summer, it turns out, will not have to be made. We'll be able to do both things. So we're on track now for about a 25% increase compared to spring 2023, whereas the alternatives that we showed the public were based on only a 10% increase. So again, there's your existing metro service, and there's proposed phase one. Uh, purple means 20, red means 15. Now, what I'm going to do is um, talk you through this area by area. So let's start with the west, and we'll move from west to east through the area. So here's your existing system. And what you've got here is um, the 1819 patterns that you're used to that jointly form the kind of figure eight pattern connecting um, uh, downtown Santa Cruz up to the university through a combination of Mission Western, the 18 path, and, Bay St and Boardwalk Bay Street, the 19 path. You also have a route called the 15 that sits on top of them only during the school year, providing some further frequency. And you've got the 10 every hour on High Street. In the existing system, everything breaks at the transit center. Nothing flows across it. That's a feature that we can't fix in phase one, but we, we will try to address it later on. Um, going east, you have a very complicated structure of the 71 and 69 patterns that are both ultimately going to Watsonville by various routes, and then the hourly 66 and 68 patterns that are serving the southern part of uh, Southeast Santa Cruz, Seabright, the southern part of Live Oak, ending at Capitola Mall. It's quite complicated. Here's what we think we can do. So on the west side, it's all good news. <clears throat> We can now afford the 18 and 19, both at 15 minute frequency, which will be a huge payoff for people traveling to the university and also on the west side generally. We can afford High Street. I'm I, I, sorry, I stand corrected. We do have one route coming, uh, uh, continuing across now. We can afford to have High Street every 30 minutes. And this one route, we have been able to connect through to the east side. So what you now see is Route 3 on the west side, on covering High Street to the university, continues across downtown and out the east side, uh, going, through, going through Seabright and Live Oak. Now, there are a bunch of little complexities here that I should mention briefly. One of the things that's is happening here, I'm sorry, there's a clear switch. Well, I don't seem to have a pointer, unfortunately, so I'll have to talk you through this um, without one. As you see the three going east out of downtown on Broadway and turning left on Seabright, what's going on there, as you probably know, is that the Murray Street Bridge is going to be closed for, a, for construction for a while. And as a result, it is not possible to go down to the south end of Seabright. There'll be no way for buses to do that physically while that bridge is closed. That's why you see the three going back up to Soquel and Capitola Drive to 7th. There's no other way to get across the, the water there. Then it comes down, and in response to the public feedback that people preferred to see this route split into two hourly pieces here, that's what we're doing. So we have an hourly piece that goes via Twin Lakes and an hourly piece that goes via Bromer and 7th, on east on Portola. Then there was another question of the public. Right now you have once an hour service going up 38th and once an hour service going up 41st. The public feedback on that led us to suggest that the right thing was actually to send all the service via 38th to Bromer to 41st as the way to best split the difference between those and keep the frequency together. Now, one and two, as you see there, are the routes that are replacing what are now called 69A, 69W, and 71. We think one and two are simpler numbers that will be easier for people to deal with. Um, these two routes are, are both every half hour, and they're designed to leave downtown Santa Cruz offset. That's why you have a red line coming out of downtown Santa Cruz where you see them together, one and two because there's a bus every 15 minutes there, then you see the red line split into two blue lines, which is a bus goes this way, the next bus goes that way, and you have 30-minute service beyond that split point. They both, Highway uh, uh, Route 1 goes up, up Soquel Drive past Dominican, Route 2 goes Capitola Road, Capitola Mall, and up 41st. They come back together, and they come back together into a purple line, which means that the worst possible wait is about every 20 minutes there. The reason for that is that if buses come out of Santa Cruz evenly spaced, and then one goes a longer path and one goes a shorter path, they're no longer evenly spaced where they come back together. 
So there'll be about a 10 minute gap and then about a 20 minute gap. That's just how the scheduling will work. But still, that is much more frequency between Cabrillo and Santa Cruz and between Cabrillo and Watsonville than you have now. Much more regularly scheduled frequency. Consistent. So before, after. Now, I should mention here too, by and large, these changes don't have much effect on the San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley, but there is one small exception, which is that in the existing system, service coming down from the north, from Scotts Valley on the 35, every hour, half of them go down Emmeline's, uh, uh, Emmeline Street and that, um, past the county social services office, which slows down the trip from Scotts Valley. So in the proposed system, a different route, Route 4, covers that area so that all the 35 services can come the fast way into town saves a few minutes on trips in from Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley. So mid-county, Aptos, Capitola. So here's the existing system. It's quite complicated. Um, and here is the proposed streamlining of it. So now again, you have one and two, coming, both coming from Santa Cruz, rejoining at 41st and Soquel, and then with a worst case frequency of about 20, coming across past Cabrillo. When we get to Aptos, they split again. Half the service jumps on the freeway at State Park. Another half of the service continues on Soquel through Aptos, jumps on the freeway at Freedom. And then they're both on the freeway into Watsonville. New Route 73 is an hourly service that's replacing just the rural segment of Route 71. Right now you're running 30 minute service through a rural area on Route 71, the rural part of Freedom Boulevard, west of Airport Way in, in Watsonville. The only destination on that segment is Aptos High School. So the recommendation is that that piece be broken off as a feeder route. And so you see it coming from Cabrillo College, going down and heading up Freedom Boulevard. We'll get to Watsonville, and I'll show you what it does, does there. But the idea is that allows more of your, of your service to all go into Watsonville from the Highway 1 side, which means better service to both downtown uh, Watsonville and to Watsonville Hospital, both of which are much bigger transit destinations than anything on the rural part of Freedom Boulevard. Aptos High School, remember generally about high schools, they produce a bunch of demand once a day or twice a day at their peak times, but they don't fill buses all day. They don't generate the kind of all day demand that a hospital does or a big downtown. So finally to Watsonville. I have unscrambled a lot of incredibly complicated transit networks in my day, and Watsonville is really still kind of amazing to me how complicated the existing <laughs> network is. It's an enormous tangle of overlapping buses, none of which are likely to be coming when you need them. These pale blue lines mean a bus coming once an hour. We know we can do a lot better for this than Watson in Watsonville, not just in terms of their access to Santa Cruz, but also just the ability to get around town. So there's the existing network, and here's the proposed. So as you see, in the proposed network, we've done a lot of streamlining to get you four one, two, three, four significant half hourly routes operating locally in Watsonville that are now frequent enough to really be useful. And in certain cases, there'll be some, uh, some effective uh, combined frequencies higher than that. So again, by breaking off the 73 into a local route, the, freedom, the rural part of Freedom Boulevard, we can now have four buses an hour coming down Highway 1, half of which, Route 1, come off at Airport Way, go through the hospital, go over to Freedom Center and come down Freedom and Lincoln into downtown. The other half of them come straight in on Main Street into downtown. They come together downtown. So this is now enough frequency that the main destinations inside Watsonville are connected with each, with, with each other with a bus that has some hope of coming somewhere near when you need it. Also, we have an, a new half hourly route that goes out Main Street, turns and um, goes up um, Green Valley across the center of the city to Freedom Highway. And then it's continuing on north at Green Valley and north from Malibu again. Route 79, which goes out to the east, we've doubled the frequency on this route. It's currently only, every, only every hour. To do that, however, we've had to come off of a, take service off of a little street called Martinelli, whose service was only running in one direction anyway, and therefore wasn't really that useful and wasn't really being used. So there's some people on Martinelli who will have to walk further to service, but they were already walking to service in one direction anyway because the service was only running in one direction. So um, those are some of the adjustments. Route 78 also is a new service that covers Beach and Ohlone on the west side and the county uh, social services that are on that cul-de-sac um, off of Barton Slough near the 
freeway, and that then flow on through to carry to to do some other bits of coverage up to Freedom Plaza. So, um, quite a different structure in Watsonville. Uh, oh, one other thing: 91 is there just a couple trips on the peak. We want there to be a lot more of it, but we're going to start with just a couple trips on the peak to start, is what we can afford now. 91 is proposed to be different than the old 91 some people remember. In the old 91 some people remember it was Watsonville Cabrillo College, Santa Cruz. But now, with the new 1 and 2, Watsonville has a nice express to Cabrillo College anyway. Uh, the 1 and 2 already do that. So we're going to suggest that the new 91 not stop at Cabrillo College, that it be a non-stop from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. We think that'll be more effective. We think that'll deliver travel times to be more useful to a lot of people. So the other improvements in phase one, routes one, two, and three would each operate every 30 minutes later in the evening than now uh, until 9 p.m. And there'd be some service on them every 60 minutes all the way till midnight. So until 9 p.m. in both directions, if you think about how these services add, add up, there's a bus every 15 minutes between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. There's a bus every 10 to 20 minutes at Cabrillo College to both Santa Cruz and Watsonville. And there's a bus every 30 minutes or better on all parts of Soquel Drive. So if the board approves the phase one proposal today, and the project team will immediately proceed to preparing the major service change to be implemented in December. <clears throat> a bunch of tasks that have to be done right away, writing or publishing new route maps and schedules, preparing for the re-signing of bus stops in late December, writer and public information efforts throughout this period. At this point, I would like to stop and answer any of your questions about phase one, anything that you feel you need to know in order to make a decision. And then I think the next step would be to go into the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Walker. I'll bring it to our director's questions. OK, Vice Chair. I just want to make sure I understood. The 25% increase in service, that's in phase one by December? That's, that's what we're looking at, yeah. Fantastic. Being able to do that. Thank you. Director Rockin. Could you comment on the extent to which making these changes in December helps pave the way for phases two and three versus if we imagine the other way, other way around? That is, where do we want to be in the end and, and you know, get ourselves in front of the voters and do all this stuff? Um, are we, is there a waste in this step or not? Or how do you sort of view that question? Um, I'm going to defer to your CEO, I think, on that, whose job it is to actually uh, deliver this. I, 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 I would say that the strategy that has been articulated to us and that we certainly don't disagree with is to recognize that the hunger for better transit service is so intense that the sooner you do something about it, the more positive feedback you're going to get to go into later phases. But I don't know if your CEO wants to make additional comments about that. I would just mention that this phase one really is a building block for phase two, uh, which you'll see if you like phase one. <laughs> and uh, I do like phase one. Yeah, I mean it's uh, this is uh, pretty cool stuff, pretty neat stuff. I mean this this is good service for people who are hungry for it. But um, phase two, we were anticipating. We can talk more about it after we. Uh, exit phase one and start talking about phase two, but phase two was really something that staff wanted to get off the ground in the first half of 2024. So this phase one happens in December and then very quickly gets replaced by phase two. It's a brief phase one, a building block, and then phase two comes in. Um, Director Downing and then Director Pegler. What type of tracking are you going to be doing of the phase one um, implementation so that we can review it to make potential changes during the next phases? I keep thinking about the 91X and how that isn't going to stop at Cabrillo anymore. And you mentioned that, you know, that's taken care of. But I just wondered what measures are going to be put in place because we're making some changes now um, and we're going to make more. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about tracking that and how how you'll incorporate that into the next phases if you sure. have thank interesting you. new information from it. Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, we currently have automatic passenger counters installed fleet-wide, which is the first time in Metro history, which allows us to track ridership every stop throughout the system. We've never been able to do that. And we also think it'll be NTD certified, so it means we can certify the data to the FTA by the end of the year. Um, so. As soon as the phase goes in, we'll be tracking data at every stop 
uh, in real time, essentially. Uh, the second piece is we have this new uh, computer-aided dispatch uh, automatic vehicle locator system installed as well, which is giving us all the real-time information that's out there on the street. So we'll also be able to track reliability, runtime, and make adjustments to the schedule to go through. So really for the first time in the three and a half years that I've been here, we actually have data, uh, good data, robust data to track not just ridership, but uh, on-time performance and travel time. You're based to a one day a year survey. survey. Us, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my questions, I think, are for Mr. Walker. Um, I'm, and they have to deal with schedule, uh, meaning the timeline for implementation. And I'd appreciate a reality check. If we have three months from today until we implement this, is that realistic for educating our community on the changes that we're bringing about? These are significant changes on routing, numbers, so forth. Uh, and the second part is, I believe that the Pacific Station reconstruction is now postponed until February. So we'll implement the winter quarter service in uh, December, and then we'll have to move the downtown facilities mid-quarter. So kind of two changes going on. Does that make sense? Looking for the reality and the comfort of implementing and educating the public. I'm not going to tell you that you can't do it. Yeah. I think that it is it certainly from my the thing, thing I can say as a consultant it is, is I normally would advise allowing six months for these tasks, but you have a different situation. You have a relatively compact community. You have uh, an extremely motivated leadership that's very committed to doing this, and I think you also have a, a rather well networked community where I think the education is going to be easier than it is in a lot of places. Although it's still a lot of work, especially when we're getting into the minority language communities and people who aren't as plugged into the process. But I'm not going to say it's impossible. I think it can succeed. Thank you. I have quite a few questions, sorry. Um, so just so I'm clear, phase one, we'll start with phase one. Um, it looks like the 15 would cease to exist. Can you verify whether or not that's just a numbering convention and if the capacity will still remain? So let's count capacity going up the hill here. So what you have right now on uh, going between downtown and the university is three half hourly routes plus two hourly routes. So that's two, four, six, eight buses an hour. What you have here is two 15 minute routes, a 30 minute route and a 60 minute route. So that's eight, nine, 10, 11, uh, that's 8, 9, 10, 11 buses an hour. So the total quantity of service going up the hill is going up from 8 buses an hour to 11 buses an hour, which is why you won't miss the 15. Notice, for example, that the 3, which is about has about the same travel time going up the hill as the 15 does now, uh, is up being upgraded from hour late every 30 minutes. So I don't think anyone will miss the 15. Got it. Okay. And then the 18 and the 19 are now every 15 minutes, correct? That's right. Always coming soon. All right. Um, and I don't mean to skip ahead to phase two, but I'm just trying to make sure I understand what phase one is versus what phase two is. Uh, is phase two, is there a requisite for access to the West Remote Parking Lot at UCSC's residential campus for phase one to be feasible? Well, if you look here at what Route 3 is being drawn as doing, yep. we are... We would, I would prefer that if Route 3 is going to run continuously all the way across the city, it'll run more reliably if it can get a break on the campus. If it can't get a break on the campus and it has to end in a one-way loop of the campus, then the bus has to go all the way from Capitol Mall to the campus and back to Capitol Mall without a break, and that's going to make it less reliable. So the university can help make this service more reliable by making it possible for that route to terminate on the campus. That has been the key barrier to getting continuous east-west service across Santa Cruz from the campus to the east side of Santa Cruz is not having a place to take a break on the campus. Phase two, which we'll get to in the next part of the agenda, does assume that a much more substantial terminus has developed on the campus, and, and that's where you see a significant increase in east-west service across the campus, uh, across the city, and that is tied very directly to having a larger terminus. Okay. What yeah, sorry, not to dig too deep uh, and go down a rabbit hole, uh, but what about a continuous loop from Capitola campus back to Capitola? 
makes what what variable is making it less reliable there versus ha being able to stop and it, right. what's the what's so as the bus is there? going down the road it's stuff happens mm -hmm. that, and stuff happens that make it get late so the reliability of a bus is directly related to how long it has been going since it last had a break because at its last break is where it had an opportunity to catch up to its schedule if it was so your reliability is directly proportional to how far the bus has been going since it last had a break. That's why we think it's important, that's why it's critical to get a terminus facility on the campus if you're going to be able to run service continuously across. 18 and 19 work now because they're short. The bus only lays over downtown. It does not have a break on the campus. It loops the, breaks, the campus continually. But because of that, by the time it gets downtown, it really, again, it really needs a break. It can't go further. Or it would just be too unreliable. So that's the principle. You think about how far has, how long has the bus been running since it last had a break, and that's what's going to drive your reliability. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of questions. The first is, and you've, since you've got this slide up on the screen, I mean, you mentioned that the 3A and B are rooted the way they are because we're assuming, or we know that the Murray Street Bridge seismic upgrade project is on the horizon and we're not gonna be able to go over the Murray Street Bridge. If we vote for this phase one today, is there a built-in assumption that once that project is complete, that 3B, or sorry, 3A then starts routing over that bridge? Yes, I think the long-term assumption would be that 3A, which you see, if you describe it from the east, it's coming along Portola into Cliff, goes down into Twin Lakes, and we see it going north on 7th. I think you'd assume that once you have the bridge, it would turn west on Murray, north on Seabright, and west on Broadway, that that would be the two-way path, so that you'd have the service back at, at Seabright and Murray. Um, but what we're showing here is what we anticipate to be the detour in effect for several years. Yeah, I'm, you know, I've looked at this map a lot, and you know, ultimately, I do think this is probably the best solution. Um, I mean, I, as much as I like the simplicity of the greater frequency with the three just having one spot, we need a way for people to basically get between uh, lines two and three, and you know, get to key destinations like Simpkin Swim Center and um, get up and down Seabright. So I think this ultimately is a pretty elegant solution. Um, the other question actually was with the South County map around Watsonville. You mentioned that there was a route that would get people to the county facility. I assume you meant the new Westridge facility that we're opening up off of Green Valley. So would that be the 72 or 75? You mean right here? Okay. Um, the, county the, there's the county office is there on that cul-de-sac off of Arkansas Road um, that has some social services. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm seeing Main Street in the in the highway. So, I mean, because the the facility is ultimately north of the highway. We're talking about different things. Then. Yeah. Okay. Seventy-eight. Well, it is. It is still so, north yeah. of Highway One. Highway One right. is over. Right. Over That's what was there. throwing me for a loop. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Seventy-eight to Westridge. Great. Um, and then the final question is, I mean, I see in our, yeah, um, so phase one does require a little bit more money, as you said. Uh, I think the packet outlines about $2 million more per year. Is that right? And then um, that would be coming out of the, as you said, the sort of plus up from state money that we've seen in this budget cycle. Um, can you just, you know, for transparency with the board, remind us how much total is available? Um, and then if we're using that $2 million, I think the suggestion is over the next four years, you know, how much that that uses up. Yeah, and I think John was costing out phase one, literally just getting all the details in order on, on the actual cost of phase one. So John, if you've got a, a latest on that. It's about a 7% increase uh, over pre-COVID levels, let's say. So it is an increase in operations. But one tricky thing about it is we don't know the we don't know the full cost until we actually design the service. It, we know how much revenue hours we will project increasing, but the actual cost is measured in really the number of bus operators that are required to operate the service. But we think it's about a 5 to 7%. And so, yeah, the idea was it's hopefully mostly cost neutral, but any overrun that we are being conservative, 1.5 to 2 million, 
uh, and, and operating expense per year could be drawn from the, the one-time TERSIP money, which is uh, the plus up, which is $28 million, uh, to be spent over four years. Okay, so the $28 million, we're, we're roughly saying it's likely we might need, we, we could need to spend up to $8 million of that to provide for phase one yeah. increased service at this time. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Other questions? Uh, just um, uh, on 35, uh, again, is that um, the frequency is it going to be the same? It's going to be reduced to a half hour? Or? So 35 is already coming down the hill every 30 minutes from Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley. And what you see happening right now as it comes down the hill is that it branches into two pale blue lines because half the service um, goes down Emmeline Street and half the service goes straight into right. town. So what we're doing is eliminating that Emmeline deviation so that all the 35s do the same thing. So we're not increasing the frequency to the valley, but it will be more regular and more reliable, and every bus will go in the same way. Other questions? Um, I have one uh, additional question. Director Pegler kind of got to it, but what are some of the specific tactics um, to make sure we reach out to the harder reach populations. I'm thinking youth, um, monolingual Spanish speakers. So I don't know who can answer that. If, if we approve it today, we have three months essentially to notify the public and, and we'll get going this afternoon. Um, but we'll, we're, we're, got, we're planning to target a lot of at uh, bus stop information. So posted flyers, notices, translated, of course, in English and Spanish. Um, and I think we'll also uh, develop a roadshow, if you will, go to city councils, uh, any commissions that we can get in front of uh, for the next three months to make sure that the word is out there, in addition to the, tr the traditional avenues that we, that we uh, disseminate our information at Metro, social media, our, our website, our uh, email list, et cetera. Um, we also have some new tools uh, where we can publish this information to Google Maps, to transit, so that people currently riding the bus that use those avenues will see uh, service notices pop up. Great, and perhaps some of those stakeholder groups that and I go back to the stakeholders. Some of those yeah, and so as we develop phase two, we're going to be going back and doing outreach and going back to the stakeholders. So it's another opportunity to say, here's what's coming phase one. By the way, thank you, Director Downing. Yeah. Um, a lot of people get their information just from the bus stop when they're standing there. Yep. And um, you're going to be moving some stops and removing some stops, um, mm. a few. Um, do you tend to, because I don't, I don't know myself, but do you tend to post something on that stop saying the stop's moving and um, so that people have enough notice? I know sometimes the bus stops you know, don't have as much information. Yeah, I think there's there's maybe th five bus stops that may be eliminated, eliminated. So for sure, we'll be posting notices many, there. Yeah, but we'll hear from whoever it is. <laughs> of course, yeah. and and for that individual, it's a big impact. Um, but we'll also plan to just post at every bus stop mm. where there's a service change. Thank you, mm -hmm. Director Rodkin. I don't know if we usually do this, but given that the school's starting at UCSC fairly soon. We might think seriously about doing advertising um, flyers at the bus stops, um, but also even paid advertising on occasions in the press or something like that, yeah. because that's a huge target audience. And try to think about it. I mean, social media will reach some of them, and and there, that's also a group that will be very quick to think about using their phones to gather further information. So, posting stuff that says, "If you get on your phone, this is what you <laughs> this is what you need to do," or something. But that seems like we don't usually purchase like full page ads and stuff, but that might be worth thinking about. That's a great idea. Thank you for that. And just to reiterate, so we have a process now where we, we post a laminate tie to every bus stop when there's a service change. So we're going to do the same thing. It's and every every route number change, every every change you see on this map will have that posted. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Director Henderson and then Director Randall. So the end of the fall, or excuse me, the end of the fall quarter is December 15th, is that a date that you're kind of targeting for this to go potentially live after that? December 21st. Thank you. 
And, and one other <laughs> uh, suggestion yes. for our, um, you know, high school, middle school, if we, if if information is sent to those schools, they can send the information back uh, out with parents, yeah. and even some of the, uh, you know, we have the Ed Foundation or these types of things that will help disseminate that information. Yeah. So, and probably all of us in our communities may have a contact to be able to help with that if needed. Yeah. And then the other place I think we could hit is senior centers. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for those suggestions. Just a quick side note on the students: uh, Youth Cruise Free is now over 400% increase year over year in ridership, which is double what it was uh, kind of when schools went on break. So the word is definitely getting out there through the schools. I, I let one of our high school students that's um, disadvantaged know about the free passes, and he was so excited and helped spread the word too. So I, I'm i thrilled to see the increase for our students. Yeah, 400%. Clearly the word wow. is, is getting out there. Okay, if there aren't other questions at this point from directors, I'll open it up for public comment. Um, and please, yeah, thank you. I was gonna ask if you could line up, <laughs> line up against this wall. Eduardo Montesino, uh, I'm a service guy. I've been here for, for a while. Um, God, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really excited about phase one, but I'm more excited about phase two that we'll talk about later. You know, um, this is an opportunity. This is, you know, uh, uh, you know, in a very, very long time. I've been here for a lot of years, and we've been gone from down, 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 ha having to uh, uh, get, um, you, um, you know, contractors like Jerry, uh, Jerry Walker to tell us how how we how we cut, cut. So, th so this is exciting. You know, this is actually exciting for the community. It's actually going to change the community trajectory. We're, you know, we're, we're doing Highway 1. We're doing SoCal improvements. We're, you know, we're building capacity. You know, so, you know, I'm really excited. We need to get all on board. And it, but it's all of us. And it's encompassing about all of us to get uh, get the word out, um, because it's not only for just the riders that are riding the system, but it's getting the word out to the outer community that they're not going to be able to have an option, an option to you know to leave their car. Maybe it's not all the way, but maybe you know it's half away that can get them to a destination where they need to go. So I'm really excited. The community, uh, I think it's ripe. Um, we need to make those improvements, but like I said, I'm more excited about the phase two. <laughs> but um, this is really good improvements. So I urge you to uh, approve them. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Montesino. My name is Dodie Anderson, and I am a resident of La Selva Beach, and I was a regular, live, um, excuse me, bus um, user when it came to La Selva Beach. Um, I'm speaking for myself and also for all those people who signed a petition from La Selva Beach to please bring back the bus service. Um, first, I'd like you to know that the community of La Selva Beach is really grateful for the possible return of bus coverage. We have not had bus coverage for over 10 years. And um, that has created, we, we've been stranded like an island. We have no way to go to the doctor, to go to school, <laughs> to go shopping, and to go to any um, entertainment venue. This is over 10 years. So just as a side comment, please, Please don't delay this. We have been waiting so long. I think if you speak to any resident anywhere, they're going to say, no, <laughs> give it to us now. <laughs> um, so we, we're happy that you're going to consider bringing the bus back to us. And we would like to emphasize that there is a um, bus stop that is already on Playa, which is near the um, El Patio grocery store, and we'd like to, you to consider having that where the bus stops because that bus stop is already covered for inclement weather. It is um, near a lighted facility. The um, stop is the closest uh, you could get to our library, to our church, and to our, our community clubhouse. Oh, okay. 
please finish up your sentence. Are you, are you complete? I would like to say that we want to thank you for bringing back access. And please leave the bus stop where it is. OK. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Chair and Board Members. I'm Claire Gologli. I'm the Transportation Planner for the City of Santa Cruz, here to express our sincere support for the Phase 1 proposed network. The service enhancements that will be going in as part of this really increase mobility for the entire city and for those in the city who are traveling outside the city to Cabrillo, to Capitola, to jobs, um, medical appointments, everything else that people just need to do as part of their daily lives. We're also very, very appreciative of the opportunity we had to participate in the design charrette to give our feedback on this, to be able to work directly with Metro staff and the consultants to refine the concepts to make sure that it was serving the broadest cross-section of our community, and to also give big kudos for the really robust public outreach that was done to bring this plan forward. So we're really excited and hopeful that this will roll out, and we're also um, a really willing partner to continue to disseminate all of the information to riders through the various platforms that we have to get the word out about the big changes, the exciting changes that hopefully will be happening. So thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for your work. Good morning, Chair Kalantar Johnson and uh, Metro Directors. My name is Matt Farrell, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Board of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. Uh, we strongly support uh, the implementation of this uh, plan. We think that it's a critical foundation in rebuilding our transit system that will give us a foundation to move forward with the work that comes out of the rail concept study. All the forms of transit need to be integrated the bus and the rail, and we see this as a way to step forward. So thank you to everyone for the, your work, and uh, thank you for my, my, my uh, early anticipation of your unanimous approval of this phase. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Faina Siegel, also from Friends of the Rail and Trail. We fought really hard to get the TERSIP funds included in this budget, and we are so excited to see it implemented in such a fantastic way in our community with 25% expanded service. This is really great. It affects everybody in our community, and we're excited to see us building up the transit ridership so spectacularly. So thank you directors, and thank you, CEO Tree, and the entire staff of Metro for making this happen. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Metro board and staff. What an exciting time for our community and for addressing climate change and equity. Rarely do we have the opportunity to be a part of the groundbreaking changes in transportation systems that is happening right here at Santa Cruz Metro. And it takes vision, thank you Michael Tree, and a whole lot of work, thank you to all of you and your staff, to create a simpler yet more effective system. And it was an honor to be a part of a stakeholder group in the reimagined Metro process. Uh, by the way, my name is Lonnie Faulkner representing Equity Transit. The kind of changes being proposed here with phase one and soon with phase two will make a real difference in the lives of our community members for the better. Starting with the first phase, increasing service to 15 minute key segments in some areas really is a grand, ground changer. But the real exciting changes lay in the future when Metro moves to 15 minute service across the entire county with phase two. The direction Metro is moving will address three important issues, that's mitigating climate change, more jobs, and equity, by providing regular, dependable, frequent, and hopefully free service. Close to 30% of our community does not have reliable access to a car. My son is an example who he used public transit throughout high school, so we didn't have to be in that long line of cars at schools that you see. Um, and as an adult, he doesn't own a car and relies on his bike and bus to get to work. 
it is increasingly expensive to afford a car. So providing alternatives to driving a car is a critical step to addressing our climate crisis and equity. And I would like to ask and urge the Metro Board today to please support phase one of Reimagine Metro and look towards phase two. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Rohan Twilley. I'm a UCSC student. Uh, some of you may already know me as the person behind Metro's bus stop signage and the Route 18. And I'm really excited about these proposed service changes. It's awesome to see it finally happening. And I want to thank Metro's planning department and Jarrett Walker and Associates for making this possible. Um, I do have some concerns as, do concerns as to some other members of the UCSC community about the proposed routing through campus of the Route 3. Uh, I was talking with some staff members at TAPS uh, including bus operators, supervisors, and uh, the assistant transit managers. Um, they're concerned that the proposed uh, routing for Route 3, as shown in the map, requires turning movements that are physically impossible for a bus to safely complete. Um, we acknowledge that the bidirectional routing through campus is incredibly important for having this east side thing. We want to make sure that that's possible. Um, but the key issue of having the bus where it's currently shown turning around at the Arboretum, uh, they were greatly concerned about that and that Metro had not communicated this to them. Um, we were sufficiently concerned about this um, that we planned out several alternative routings that better seat the needs of UCSC, and we really want to make sure it's easy as possible uh, to do this for Metro to implement it without disrupting the Phase 1 proposal, because the Phase 1 proposal was great. So we actually went out and tested this in a bus yesterday to make sure that you can do these routings on campus. Um, and these routings meet the following goals. One, all the turning movements can be safely completed, no arboretum. Uh, number two, the outbound terminal of the route has a place where the bus can safely lay over and crucially has a bathroom for the operator to use during that break. And then three, buses enter and exit campus through the west gate to minimize the amount of time people have to spend on the bus. Um, and we put together a overview of the different options we tested and I've submitted in written comment what all of those are, as well as the video from the test we did uh, with the TAP staff. Thank you. Thank you for those recommendations um, and for speaking. You have those in writing? You sent, I think you sent them to us. We'll, we'll take a look. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm a student at UCSC. And I would like to talk a little bit about alternative solutions for turning around at the Arboretum. One solution we tried was Cowell Circle. Uh, there is ample space to turn around using the circle, uh, even with the bike rack lowered. Two buses can lay over at the same time without obstructing traffic. Uh, the bus stop is also ADA compliant. There are several bathrooms adjacent that could be used during the layover. And service area to Cowell, Cowell stop, Circle Stop provides greater coverage for academic and residential buildings than the existing stop on Hagar Drive. A second option is East Remote Overflow Lot. Buses can turn around in the East Remote and go through East Remote in order to turn around. This is something TAPS, Upper Campus Bus, has used many, time, used many times during the day. And there is an existing bus stop inside East Remote that buses can lay over at. There's also an adjacent overflow lot that more buses could lay over, which is way closer to bathrooms. A third option is Barn Theater lot. Buses would essentially go, do a full loop or on campus, pull into Barn Theater after running counterclockwise. This is something TAPS clockwise loop and night upper campus buses already do many times each day. Although taking the Quarry Plaza or East Remote, of, although this is longer, this routing has more advantages of serving each stop that Metro currently serves on campus including low ridership stops in the Meadow area and East Campus. The fourth option is Quarry Plaza. Here, there is an existing red curb that allows for ADA-compliant bus stop where the bus can drop off passengers before turning around. Uh, although when we tested it, the, um, we weren't able to make that circle, make a loop there without... Oh. You can finish your sentence, okay. please. <laughs> without, um, we, we couldn't have the, the bus, like, the bike rack lowered while making the turn. So in conclusion, 
uh, Cowell Circle, East Remote, Barn Theater, and Quarry Plaza are better places for turning around compared to the Arboretum for Route 3. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Thomas Dillo. I'm, I'm another UCSC student. And um, just after going through all these proposed turning around options, um, I'd like to reiterate how much how excited we are for this for this phase one proposed network. It's great. Um, it's very excited. We're all excited. Um, all, and all I want change is the turnaround location. I don't think it could work. Um, and some of the benefits for other potential turnaround locations is increasing capacity, as you don't have to go through the empty part of, empty part of campus on Hagar Road. You can go up like west. You can go up Empire Grade, and you'll have more busy parts of campus served faster. And the ability to restrict um, short on-campus journeys through outbound drop-off only and inbound pickup only buses on campus ensure there's enough um, capacity for essential off-campus journeys. So they are not clumped up with, in, with people who should be taking a loop bus, for example. Um, also, outbound delays no longer would cascade onto outgoing trips, like um, Jerry Walker said earlier. Um, then right is also, it would save riders having, having to wait at the time point at Science Hill for like five plus minutes when service is lower or ridership is lower, which is a massive convenience. There are many times where I have to wait for the bus to go. Um, and then finally, if all, if all Metro buses are directly like this, it'd be great as well. Um, I would strongly, I would strongly, I would love it if more buses run like the three does if there's a proper turnaround place located on campus. Um, and then overall, we just we urge Metro to consider this feedback. Um, phase one is great overall, but this is a weak point in phase one, we believe. Thank you. Thank you. Also, if you feel free to reach out, reach out, reach out to us if there's more questions, we're there, happy. Will do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Perez. Um, I work with Regeneración Pajar Valley Climate Action. I'm also part of the Santa Cruz County Commission for the Environment. And uh, our communities are experiencing climate change and areas like Watsonville are disproportionately affected. And I think Metro is definitely gonna play a, a role as a local solution to climate. And I hope that there is more um, frequency and more service in areas disproportionately affected by climate change like Watsonville is. Um, and I also, I think the changes are great. I did notice that there is, um, in Watsonville, there are no routes going to Santa Cruz from the Holohan stop um, near the school district. And there is an apartment complex there behind the Arco station where many families and youth live. Um, and, re, uh, and kind of not having this access from that that stop adds 15 to 20 minute walk to either, both both of the next like alternative bus stops. And one of them, the one going towards Airport Boulevard, walk, as you walk to Safeway for that stop, there's no light whatsoever. And many, um, many of the youth even come to Santa Cruz to work at the boardwalk really, really late. And that's like the closest way to get to those that apartment complex. So I think that really would be super dangerous for um, the youth, but also the, the school district is right there in that stop. And the school district, also many parents go there for getting the um, school buses for, for their children in their schools. And also it has served as a COVID testing site in the past. So I would like to see that if that route could stay connected. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Romeo Vidal, um, bus operator. Um, wanted to uh, just say we don't have a service in uh, Corralitas area. We used to have a 72 that service that area. And I'm uh, just wondering if there's going to be changes going to that area during uh, um, school hours. The traffic on Freedom in Curry Littles every morning is just way too crazy. And I think if you put a service back to Curry Littles during those times, that will help with the traffic and Freedom in Curry Littles. And also, with the shortages with the school bus operators, 
that will also help um, bring those kids to school. That's all. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Antonio Rivas from the city of Watsonville. I think I know a lot of people here around here. So one of the things that I'm very concerned is that, you know, the increase of the city population in the city of Watsonville, as well as the Live Oak, is very important that you'll be able to, in the future, to be able to accommodate them. In the city of Watsonville, we need more frequency routes. If you can be able to implement now a bus or two buses that will include Green Valley, East Lake, Riverside, Freedom Boulevard, Airport Boulevard, it will be great. So they can be able to go to the different routes, to the hospital, to Salud para la Gente, different areas in which a lot of our seniors and our people will use. It is important that we, because I know you decided to have it in Santa Cruz, but not in Watsonville. Like always do, you always left us behind. It's important that you consider that. If you're not considering in phase one, make sure that you include it in phase two. It's important to our city of Watsonville. It's increasing. Our city population is increasing very much. And we need that. We need that frequency in our city of Watsonville. Make sure as you make decisions now and phase two to make sure our city of Watsonville is covered because many, many, many years you have left us behind, and you know that. So finally, you're doing something good. So I hope Metro be able to do that. It is important to our, to our citizens and also for the non-English speaking uh, people. Make sure that when you do signs, do it visually and make it bigger so they can see it important. Thank you. Thank you. I don't even know if you want to start that up. So I want to talk about some of how we got here because I've been hearing some things about turn movements and some assumptions about what we can and cannot do. I have personally driven every line on this map. 35 foot, 40 foot, and 60 foot variety. Everything here is possible. It is not essential that we make that button hook turn or have a layover on the campus in order to pull this off. We can loop it. It will be long. It will be less reliable. It will be possible. The only thing that we cannot currently do is hold over multiple buses in that West Remote parking lot. We absolutely can drive through there, although there are some concerns with that particular area. There are concerns that we can work around. I also want to let you know that on a majority of these routings, I didn't drive alone. Michael and John both went with me. So they have full knowledge of what this looks like in practice, physically in a bus. We know that we can get this done. So those aside, been here for a very, very long time under the same system. I was here pre-cuts, I was here post-cuts, pre-COVID, post-COVID, through all of it, right? We, we've, seen, we've seen a lot, but the consistent thing that we've seen is a decrease in ridership. And we are finally now building the foundation to change that. And when I think back of everything that we've been doing in the last year and a half, it has always been met with resistance because change is difficult. Nobody necessarily likes it straight out until they realize, hey, this is going to be okay. It's very, very scary. How are you going to pay for this? How are you going to drive this? But we were here, and how were we going to get new buses? Well, we're getting 57 new buses. How are we going to find drivers? We're down by so many. Well, now we're not. Every challenge that we've seen so far in the last year and a half we've met, we've exceeded, and we've put the service on the road, and this will be no different. Our leadership, our staff, our drivers from the top to bottom, we're fully committed to this community, and we're finally ready to deliver a transit system that is truly world-class so that we can actually sit here and say we are a leader in public transportation, mean it, know it, and have the entire nation know it. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to say real quick, I understand, you know, any change is going to be really difficult to do to please every single person. But one thing we all could agree on is our system is not where it needs to be right now. We only have riders that pretty much are riding the system because they need to, 
not because they want to. And that's the biggest thing we need to do here is get people on our buses that want to be on our buses that are convenient for them. And I fully support phase one. And um, I'm excited about frequency because frequency is where it's at with public transportation, not disregarding coverage. We're still going to provide coverage. But frequency is where it's at because when you could walk to a bus stop and know you're going to get picked up in 15 minutes, that's going to get people on our buses. And so I just wanted to echo a lot of what Brandon said. And not only that, just say that I support phase one. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, I don't see anyone else standing up um, to speak, so we'll, we'll close the public hearing and I'll bring it back to the board for a motion. I see Director Rotkin's hand. I'll make a motion, but there may be discussion, obviously. Sure. My motion is that we approve the staff recommendation with this one addition, that they look at this question of the Route 3, uh, and it would be up to the, the, uh, our staff working with the consultant to determine if any of these alternatives make more sense. So let's investigate what's mm -hmm. being proposed and I'm not suggesting that they do any of those because maybe what we've done already is the best way to make it happen, but they at least give one more look at that, that particular part of the route. I just wanted to make a quick point of clarification. There's an error on the map, which I think prompted a lot of this discussion. It was never the intent to turn around on the Arboretum. Okay. It should have shown West Remote. Uh, as Brandon mentioned, none of it kind of impacts the plan, but we, we'd be happy to work with the students that did the test run to, to determine the other locations because finding a location to turn around on campus, as we'll see in phase two, is is critical uh, for that phase, but it is not critical for phase one. Either way, we'll, we'd be happy to take their suggestions. No, and there are trade-offs. Um, some of the virtues of places... Dr. Rock, and let me see if there's a second before I'll you... Second. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. There, there are um, issues about whether the best place to stop for layover for if there's a restroom and so forth and those issues. But there's also questions of efficiency and how much longer it takes to take a particular route. And I'm happy to have our staff resolve, you know, again, with the consultant, resolve that final, maybe our staff make the decision, what, what the final resolution of that issue under Route 3 would be. But I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with what we've proposed here, but let, let's look at what was being proposed and see if there's virtue in some of it. Great. Other comments, Director Rodkin? You're complete? Sure. Okay. Director I su obviously support this. I think it's fantastic. Great. Okay. Director Henderson. Yeah, um, just to kind of piggyback on that, while obviously we would support anything to better help our all of our affiliates, staff, students, and of course our guests coming to and from campus, we do need to do our due diligence on the turnaround on, on Route 3. Um, it, you, it, we need to have some internal discussions. I look forward to working with all of Metro staff, getting some more feedback from the students. Um, you know, but we absolutely need to make sure that this doesn't have or we mitigate as many unintended consequences as possible. Um, and it, it's, it's tight in there. It's tight in the West Remote parking lot. Um, and we just need to do our due diligence and we'll do that internally. And, you know, like I said, we look forward to working with everybody and trying to find a solution to make this happen. Because I, I think it's great, but we just need to make sure it, it's feasible and it works. Thank you. Other director, Director Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I uh, just want to point out, again, uh, what an amazing turning point this is for the agency. It really is the other hand to the discussion we were having this morning about buying a bunch of new buses. Because if you're going to buy close to $90 million of zero emission buses, you want them to be full. Mm -hmm. And we started this conversation because the critique that myself and a lot of the other directors have heard consistently from members of the public is, why are the buses empty? So even people who don't ride the bus want to know that our public infrastructure is being well utilized uh, and that people are able to take the bus to where they want to go. And this is really a demonstration that our agency is taking that on, that we're determined to make fast, frequent, and reliable service. Uh, and this, I mean, 25% expansion in service is, is just amazing. Uh, I really love the simplified numbers, especially in Mid-County. I think that's where we're seeing them the most. Um, so the one, two, three, it's, uh, it, First of all, makes it easier for people who haven't ridden the system before to start riding the system. And uh, second, it, it will actually change. We, we know from psychological studies that people actually perceive lower numbers as faster. The, it, the demonstration of this is actually that uh, wide receivers were recently able to start choosing lower jersey numbers. And they all have because it think, they think it makes them faster. So. I would love to see this, these numbers rolled out to more parts of the system because people will think that a, 
the four bus is faster than the 55. Um, you know, and the other piece that I really like about this is finally having uh, routes that go you know, all the way from the east side up to UC Santa Cruz. And I think that this just demonstrates a, more, a much more unified vision of how we can move forward uh, with our housing and transportation infrastructure together how the housing that we build in the city and the county can support the university and how the work that's being done on the, at the university can support uh, the rest of our civic infrastructure. This shows that we're thinking about the whole thing as, as one unit and has a unified vision for moving forward. So I really appreciate that. Thank you everyone for their work on this. Thank you. Dr. McPherson. Yeah, I'll repeat some of that. Uh, we have some tremendous pressures we know in local government for increase in the number of new housing units. And uh, if we can target our audience uh, to reach those people who are coming and who are here at the present time, we're going to have a huge benefit. But this 25% increase in service is going to really make a significant start. And being on this board for more than 10 years now, it's, uh, it's really a welcome opportunity to see us increase our service uh, to the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Okay, any other directors? Um, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, I appreciate everyone who is here today and who spoke and provided some other suggestions and recommendations. Um, I know that Watsonville came up a couple of times and we'll be hearing more about the um, enhancements to that service area in phase two. Um, I also want to thank the staff who, I know this has been a huge lift and there's more to come. So I, I want to thank you for the work that you have done and thank you in advance for the work that remains um, and for your leadership in, in moving this, um, Michael. You know, clearly the, the community is hungry for this. I, I heard it in your testimonies today and have seen it in previous correspondence and, and we're ready. We're ready as a community um, to move in this direction. And, and I know that there are a lot of eyes on us and that's a good thing, because when there's eyes on us and we're ready and we're successful, then we deepen our partnerships and, and bring in more resources. I've seen that happen in many different subject areas, and I know that we're going to make that happen here around transportation. And I've said this before, this agency has proven time and time again, and especially in this meeting today with the momentous, momentous votes we've taken, that we are more about, we are beyond moving people from point A to point B. We are really about environmental sustainability, we're about equity, and we're about overall health and well-being for the community. So I really appreciate where we are now and the direction we're going to go to, and I think with that, we will take a vote. Please. Um, Board Member Dutra is, uh, I think he's on the phone, is that what, he's uh, texting me asking if he can make a comment. Okay. If he calls in, you could put the. Yeah, <clears throat> we will be taking a vote momentarily. But first, we'll see if we can connect with Director Dutra. Hey, you want me to put you on the speakerphone so everybody can hear you? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll put you on the speakerphone this time, or I'll put Jerry on. Okay, good. Thank you. I just want to say um, I've been listening to you know, everybody's comments. Um, I wanted to also personally thank you know um, Michael and John for coming and meeting with I um, you know both myself and Vanessa and Watsonville and I'm um, you know having the conversation um, over the past you know few months um, on the revision of um, what Metro is going to look like. I've been sitting on this board for quite a while, since 2014, so I've seen the ups and downs and the, and the ebbs and flows. And um, and I understand the needs of our community. Um, you know, we you have a really solid voice in um, our representation. We are looking forward to, as phase two will be um, a lot, you know, more positive. And phase one is good, but phase two is really going to start bringing in 
um, you know, uh, what, you know, South County is looking for in their metro system. So I just want to say, um, you know, thank you for putting in the hard work. It's never easy, especially when you have, you know, um, the, the, when you have a, 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 an amount of funding you've got to deal with and um, you've got to put that into service. And um, we just want to say that we're headed in the right direction and, um, you know, I will support this. And I, I want to say thank you for those who did attend today and those of that have been working with us. I'm currently at our Cal Cities meeting. That's why I'm not there today. So um, I'm here representing our city um, of Watsonville. So, uh, but um, I look forward to, you know, meeting back up with staff as we move forward into the next phases. Thank you, Director Dutra. Thanks for um, being persistent and, and getting connected with us, even given our um, technology limitations. Okay, so I think with that, we will take a vote on the motion that was made by Director Rodkin, seconded by Director Pegler. All in favor, say aye. 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 Is, is, uh, Director Dutra signed the vote. Oh, then we need to do a roll call vote? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We are going to do a roll call vote. Uh, Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lind? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Rockin? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Okay. So, Unanimous yes, effect. thank you. Matt deserves a vote. Matt Farrell's still here. He got his unanimous vote that he wanted. Um, all right, let's move on to phase two of this agenda item. Um. Does your CEO want have any opening remarks on phase two before I plunge in? Well, this is that world-class system that uh, staff has been promising for the last couple of months to bring to you. Uh, Jarrett is, uh, he focuses on access, and I think that's the most important. Uh, I tend to focus on ridership because that's kind of an indicator of whether it's working or not, and people have that access. But... I think this is, uh, we talked about getting to 7 million. I think what Jarrett's gonna show you in this phase two, uh, combined with some incentives that staff has in mind, is gonna get you to 7 million and beyond. So with that, I'm, I'm just excited. And uh, I guess the only other thing I'll say is obviously this gets much more expensive, uh, phase two. And so staff has uh, a game plan for offering uh, what I would consider a pilot project for a number of years to get this off the ground. And we'll be uh, with the Finance Committee in October to talk about financial game plans in regard to phase one and phase two, just so that there's absolute clarity on where the money's coming from and what the you know, game plan is, both in the short and the long term. Thank you very much. So, um, <clears throat> I want to be very clear that this is the first time, right now at this moment, is the first time the public has seen this map. And it is not, whereas phase one, I was ready to present to you as a thing we can really recommend because it's been through a public conversation. We've heard the public comments and we've had a chance to work through them. We're not there with phase two. We're at the beginning of the public conversation and the next steps do involve a lot of things that will have some controversy involved in them that will need to be worked through. So I, uh, I like this map. I'm, I'm, I'm keen to present this map to you, but I also want to be clear that this is the beginning of the conversation and we're far from a point of asking you to adopt. <clears throat> in working with your staff on phase two, we were asked to assume that there would be a significant increase in funding, but also that there would be significant infusion of funding directly tied to the needs of the university. So the expansion in service that you see here in the city of Santa Cruz and Capitola in particular is directly tied to that assumption that there is financial participation in some form from the university to maybe, maybe things are run as a pilot for a while in the meantime, but that ultimately there is substantial and ongoing financial participation from the university 
in order to sustain these levels of service. Right away, as you look at phase two, you see three huge high frequency routes in Watsonville and one, three huge high frequency routes in Santa Cruz, one high frequency route into Watsonville. For that to be equitable, for that to pass our basic standards of equity, this can't all be coming out of, directly out of government funds. There has to be some other participation to fund this extreme level of service in Santa Cruz. Um, or this just would not be an equitable distribution of service between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. So that's very important to be clear. So with that assumption, um, the idea here is that lines one, two, and three now do run, all three run continuously across the center, of the, uh, the center of Santa Cruz. So that you now see one, two, and three all departing from the university, all, cro all crossing through downtown Santa Cruz, replacing the current 10, 18, and 19 paths, and all continuing east. One along Soquel, two toward, Cap toward Capitola, and three on the more complicated routing through Seabright. Now, again, for the same principle I, I, met, I mentioned before, this is not possible without a large terminal on the campus that makes it possible for routes one, two, and three to terminate on the campus and take their breaks there. We've sketched that at West Remote. It doesn't have to be there, but it does have to be such that we can go two-way through the campus to the far side of it and end there at the end of most of the demand. So West Remote is ideal for that because once you've gone up the east side of the campus, you've gone through all of the dense parts of the campus, West Remote is really the end of the campus. Um, there's, not, there's, a, there's a rural gap beyond there. The only real loser here is the Arboretum. I, as a botany geek, care about that, but in the larger scheme of things, it is possible to walk from Western to get to the Arboretum, and, um, uh, and I think that's reasonable in the context of this growth. But, so that's what you're seeing, and that's why you're seeing it. So now you're seeing one, two, and three flow, all three flowing continuously across the city from the university all the way across to Capitola. Now, further east from that, that has some knock-on effects. Even if the bus is terminating on the campus, by the time it gets to Capitola Mall or Cabrillo College, it's been going a long time and it's starting to lose some reliability, particularly in the current operating environment of what the streets are now in the absence of bus lanes or bus priority or much else to protect you from the very unpredictable levels of traffic congestion that you experience on these streets, we don't believe that those buses can, can reliably run in service all the way to Watsonville. <clears throat> For that reason, what you see is a split happening at Cabrillo College, where routes one, two, and three now, where, where, where routes one and two end, Route one ends at Cabrillo College, Route two ends at Capitola, and Route three continues to end at Capitola. And separate routes called 61 and 62 pick up from those points and continue into Watsonville. Now, the, the big payoff here is you do get the 15-minute service all the way into Watsonville. It's the route that's called Route 1 in Phase 1. Here it's called 61. Uh, comes from Cabrillo College, across Airport Way, past the hospital, and down Freedom Boulevard in Lincoln and into downtown. Um, but we do have that issue of needing it to be a separate route so that, and that, the way I would present this in Watsonville is, we need to do this in order to protect Watsonville riders from Santa Cruz's congestion. <laughs> because the congestion problems tend, as a rule, to be, to be in Aptos and further west, and we'll have a more reliable operation between Cabrillo and Watsonville if it's a separate route. Now, the other part of this, so how do you get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz? a half hour late Route 91 appears in this plan. So Route 91, the, the express that many people have been asking for, nonstop from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, um, every 30 minutes all day. That becomes the primary way that you go from Watsonville to Santa Cruz if you're going all the way to down. If you're going to Cabrillo, you use the 61 service. So inside of Watsonville then, we now have a high frequency service every 15 minutes connecting, not everywhere in Watsonville, but really connecting a lot of the biggest dots. Um, the, um, the hospital, 
the commercial area around Freedom and Green Valley, Freedom Boulevard, Lincoln Street coming in, and downtown. So this is a first shot at what phase two might look like. Um, the, um, the map shows, so this, this, is, this is basically a description of a set of improvements that Metro would like to make over the course of 2024. It requires Metro to hire enough drivers, and it requires a relationship between Metro and UCSC that is a much more complete financial partnership uh, that includes both making an on-campus terminal for uh, the buses work and also includes funding support for the Santa Cruz frequency upgrades. The intention is to proceed step by step as those three elements come online, none of which are entirely predictable from where we sit, but that these are the things that would be done as those things come online. Phase three is a longer term concept. Already by the end of phase two, Metro would be providing the highest amount of service it has ever provided. But phase three focuses on some further improvements that are in the longer term based on other priorities that were identified in outreach and, and in prior outreach processes. With phase two, we want to show clearly that staff ultimately does want to deliver on everything that the public has asked for. And this is that longer list of things. Key service ideas for phase three, weekend service levels similar to weekday. Now, I can't emphasize too strongly that ever since COVID took out much of the classic commute peak, weekends have been the place that public transit is growing most effectively all across the country. And it has to do with the fact that if you think about everyone who works in the service sector, if you think about everyone who works in retail, they all work on Saturday. They all work on weekends when those places tend to be busiest. And as a result, making life possible for a lower income person holding that kind of job and wanting to live without a car, weekend service is just critical. Likewise, evening service is critical. That's when you think about when retail closes, when you think about when restaurants close, what it takes to get everybody home. When you always, when you look at evening service, if you just take a magnifying glass to the last trip of the night, yes, the ridership will be really low then. But one of the things we've discovered, I've been through many waves of service cuts, and one of the things everyone in our industry has discovered with service cuts is that when you cut the last trip of the night, the trip before it dies. And so you cut that one and the trip before it dies. And this is what happened to evening service <laughs> in many transit agencies. So, the, the, the delivery of a full day of service, an 18, hour, an 18 or 19 hour day of service, is critical to making it possible for people to trust the service to be there whenever they need it, which makes them possible to plan their lives around it at all and to make decisions about whether to own a car based on that. Um, there's also um, an idea to make much faster service to, Fel to Felton and Ben Lomond. That what we would like to do there, if, you, if you're familiar with what the 35 does, it's quite an adventure. It goes up the length of Scotts Valley, comes back through Scotts Valley, and then finally takes you up over to Felton, and then finally picks up Highway 9, going to Boulder Creek. We'd like ultimately to separate those into two different routes, for there to be a Scotts Valley route to, um, to Santa Cruz, a separate felton Ben Lomond route coming past the Scotts Valley Transit Center, but direct into Santa Cruz without having to go up the length of Scotts Valley and back down. And those two would connect to each other at the Scotts Valley Transit Center so that it would be possible still to travel between Scotts Valley and Felton. Um, we think there's a potential for a lot more ridership out of the San Lorenzo Valley by eliminating that duplication. And finally, there's a whole list of places where we would like to introduce more frequent service, including uh, every 15 minute service on Highway 17, at least during the peak. And every 15 minutes on Watsonville local lines. And a little bit of additional frequency through Capitola Village, although Capitola Village continues to be a problem for fixed route buses because of the congestion and, and street geometry. Um, so I'm not even going to show you a map of phase, of phase three because it is, it is really just, a, a, we want to acknowledge and list that those are the ideas that have been heard from the public that also make sense to me as a, as a service planner as a set of priorities and that we would encourage you to go to next.
So phase two and three are still conceptual drafts. Um, we certainly welcome, no, no formal action is needed, but we welcome the board's advice and we are, and of course this will go forward then into a round of public outreach, which will ask people essentially, does phase two match their highest priorities for improvement? If not, how would they rearrange those priorities and how would they priorities, prioritize the longer list of improvements listed in phase three? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Director Rotkin. I have a question. We used to have a route, uh, an express, I'll call it an express route, that ran from the east side of Santa Cruz, I think it was 12A, quite a while ago, and it got cut because it was not as essential as some of the other routes we had to keep in place. But the concept was, if I remember it correctly, and we took a pin map of the, um, where every faculty, staff, and student lived and, and designed the route to gather the three stop, I think it was three stops, pick up a lot of people <coughs> in a kind of concentrated area on the east side of Santa Cruz. And then it went straight to the university without going through the downtown metro center. So people got there really quickly, relatively speaking. And again, we couldn't afford that route when we were making cuts. But it, there's been no mention of anything possibly restoring that. And the concept, I mean, I, I had, maybe there were stars in my eyes, visions, you know. Why couldn't you get your newspaper when you got on the bus? Or, you know, you could arrange all kinds of current subscription type stuff to things that maybe you charge a little more for this, whatever, but people really get a quick ride to the university and don't have to go through downtown Santa Cruz and stop at every place along the way. Because after it made those three pickups, the bus was full and it just went to the university. So is that a possible consideration for phase three? I mean, it's not, you don't have, there's not an answer like we will do it, but is that, or is that concept useful concept. Well, I think the public outreach process is a, is a great time to surface things like that and develop them and talk about them more. Um, I will say about that that that's that sort of hyper express service. There you've got these three, you've got these st three stops. We're picking up lots of people going to the campus. It's only going to happen once or twice a day that enough people from there are going yeah, to want to go there. Going, going and and so it's oriented toward a very narrow peak. The challenge with universities is that that works pretty well in the morning when lots of people want to go to the university at the same time, whenever the first class the, the first class they're attending is, it doesn't work as well in the afternoon because people tend to leave the university in a much more scattered way across the afternoon. And so you tend, universities tend to produce a sharp morning peak and a flatter afternoon peak, and it's harder to make that sort of specialized service work in the afternoon. But I'm not saying it's impossible. But you could also have an express conceivably in the morning and not in the afternoon. Yeah, you that's quite possible. the other buses. That's quite possible. I would just add that uh, we also operate the, the Route 12 only ran once in the morning inbound. Mm -hmm. That's all it did. Yeah. But we had a number of limited express buses that once the bus was full as it approached the campus, it might hightail its way to a midpoint or three stops on the campus itself. And it was very much the same thing. The bus is full. It can't take anyone more. Let's go to these other stops. So I think I want to say just about this that um, there's so much growth to be achieved at the university with sheer frequency, right? Most of the people going to the university are going all over the clock and they're going, and, and you know, not just at a concentrated peak. And they're coming and going all day and they're coming and going all evening. And so I think you're going to see the frequency by itself be transformative. I also think that once you have that frequency in place and you start seeing the ridership patterns on it, you will start then identifying the places where there are additional markets or where there is, you know, you'll encounter situations where there's overloading at certain hours, which suggests that maybe some expresses right at that time would help. And you'll start seeing, you know, the possibility for those services reemerge, but you gotta have the frequency there first. Director Downey. When you described the changes after COVID um, and wanting to expand to um, your evening and weekend service and have that available to people that have to have to go to work. Um, I didn't see holidays in there, and well, I'd ho like yeah, holiday, yeah, weekends and holidays. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, because holidays generally have the same schedule as I believe the same schedule as Sunday. We got four holidays. Right. Point taken. We can get into holidays. Okay, because I cause if you're trying to get people that no normally wouldn't ride the bus to go to the boardwalk or something on those holidays, so they don't have to drive, that would be great. Good point. We'll take, on, um, we'll, we'll take on a discussion of that. The other, uh, the other, just the note for 
for uh, Route 55, which I know we'll, we'll visit. It's um, the way it runs and doesn't run. It is currently the only bus that goes through Capitola Village. And um, I'd really like to, us to look to see who's actually going to Capitola Village when we look at service to Capitola Village, because I don't think it's people necessarily from La Selva Beach. And uh, we had a, a Zoom meeting with the La Selva community um, before reestablishing their service. And some of the comments there were, well, we don't want to go to Santa Cruz. We want to go to Watsonville. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to look, as Watsonville's growing, more people from Mid-County are going that way um, to do their business because of some of the traffic problems and because there's more available in Watsonville. So I just want us to keep that in mind. It's not just in Watsonville, but to Watsonville um, service that way. Okay. Uh, so I understand that uh, phase two is improvements over the course, course of 2024 as the resources become available, the operators, the funding. Um, but I'm wondering for phase three, do we have a goal for when that would begin or do we start implementation just once phase two is complete, whenever that may be? I think you should think of phase three as basically sort of the next tier in a list of priorities and that no one can really predict at this point exactly when, at what date you'll get to a particular point on that list. Just whenever phase two is done. Yeah. That's where we'll move. Okay, thank you. A couple things. Um, looks like 61 is a, is a 61. 61 is a circulator between Cabrillo and Watsonville, correct? Yeah, it's the eastern half of what is called Route 1 in Phase 1. Okay, so it doesn't continue on. So my, my question is um, direct service or transfer list service, at least, from Watsonville to campus. Uh, we have a, a large amount of employees that, that live in Watsonville, and it might be something that's uh, valuable to that to that group. Um, so that could be either the 91. Um, so something to keep in mind mm -hmm. that might be uh, worth considering. Um, additionally, <coughs> there's no Westgate entrance or uh, access to the campus. They're not using the Westgate at all uh, anymore, it seems, with this concept. While Empire Grade only has a few stops, uh, it's just something to keep in mind uh, that that now becomes there's a... One, there's one stop affected there. It's the stop at the Arboretum. Right, and, northbound, and southbound. Th that's the only stop on that segment. That stop is um, walkable from Western, which would be the nearest stop with frequent service. Again, I'm a botany geek. I go to the Arboretum. It's not ideal for me, but it's it's um, it seemed... Uh, and this obviously is something that yeah. you at the university are going to work out with Metro and mm -hmm. have a chance to work through exactly how this works. Yep. Um, and then just to go back to the the concept of a, of a stop on campus and how you would say, you know, stuff happens on the street mm -hmm. and it's an opportunity to catch up. Are you saying that if stuff were to happen between the Capitola Mall and campus that the stop would then be skipped in order to catch up? No. How do you, no, how do you, what I'm saying how do you is catch that, up? I mean, the service is what it is. It goes down the, it goes down the road. But I'm saying that the further, the further it has been going, <laughs> the less reliable it's going to be, uh, the further it's been going since its last break. And that's why if you want service to flow east across the city from the campus to the east side of Santa Cruz and Capitola, it has to be able to, that service has to be able to take a break on the campus. That's all I'm saying. You can't, you can't do that, you can't expect to do that in a configuration where service comes all the way into the campus, loops and drives all the way back across the city without having had a break. That, ser that returning service will become very unreliable because it's been it's going shorter, for so long. shorter break. Sorry? You end up with a shorter break at that stop, isn't that what the... You well, you need enough of a break to catch up to the schedule. You know... Uh, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Usually you about 10% of the running time. Reduce so, the break time. So I don't want to... I don't want to underestimate what that facility ultimately is. There are, right there, three 15-minute routes and one hourly route. So four, eight, 12, 13 buses an hour, all flowing two-way across the campus to a break point on the west side and all flowing back two-way. This, by the way, will take up most of what your shuttles are currently doing on the campus in terms of just carrying people back and forth around the loop because this will now be so much frequency, you know, 13 buses an hour, you know, averaging better than every five minutes. Um, but these are long routes to a 15-minute route, arriving at that endpoint, 
is going to need a break of 10, 12 minutes. The facility should be sc scaled on the assumption that now and then two buses from one route will actually stack up there. It's I don't want to, so I don't want to underestimate that facility. It needs to be quite substantial in order to be able to support this network really, really succeed. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I mean, again, love the interplay between the east side of Santa Cruz, Live Oak, and the university. I think there's never been a place I've lived in Live Oak where I didn't have university students living somewhere next door. Um, so it's definitely needed. My one question is, I mean, in that area, the difference between obviously phase one and phase two is that we're no longer splitting the three into three A and three B. Um, is there a reason why the logic that led us to split it in the for, for phase one changes with phase two? The reason the logic changes is that once we have the bridge back, this is further in the future and we've drawn it assuming we have the bridge back. Um, and that, of course, it, so whenever that happens. If you're gonna, if we come west Portola, go up seventh across Brommer, sorry, go up, go up across seventeenth um, across Brommer and back down seventh to Murray. Now we've gotten close enough to Twin Lakes, but I don't necessarily feel like I need to find the Twin Lakes on the right there. Um, that we've gotten to within walking distance of that already, um, by virtue of having gotten back down to seventh, and so that's why this is. Significant. But again, as this goes through public outreach, if this, if the, it, it, that's a question we'll ask. Would people rather see all this frequency going one direction, or would they, they rather have to continue to have the split, which will give them 30 minutes through service through Twin Lakes and 30 minutes service on Brom? Great, thanks for the explanation. Chair Jackson. So, talking about the financial basis for this, the con contributions of the university are absolutely key to make this work. And I understand we have some of these preliminary discussions that suggest that's not ridiculous, that, 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 that that's a possibility. It won't be easy. It's, going to be like, it's never, never easy to extract money uh, from a partner in these kinds of things. But it, even that is not enough to make this really work. If we want to be a world-class system, I think in our, at least in our earlier discussions, we had a pretty clear idea that we needed to look at a local tax and something like a half-cent sales tax. Um, I don't... We've talked about this in the past. I don't think we can sell this at the level of give us a half cent sales tax and we'll try and keep the system together for you. This is give us a half cent sales tax and we will have a world class system. We'll compete in Boulder, Colorado and Portland, Oregon and other places that people, you know, cite as the places where they're dealing with transportation. Um, there's a bunch of other folks that are thinking about getting the sales tax. Um, it's a strange little dance that goes on, like who gets November? 24, um, you know, when there's a more progressive vote that's out there. If we're thinking about doing this fairly soon, like November, like a vote in November, I don't know that we are. <coughs> How and when will we make a decision about beginning to like put our dibs in? I mean, so that you can, you know, when somebody says, well, we're thinking about November 24, say we've already, we put that out there already. We've been working on this thing and this is gonna get us a world class. And it's tied as Mono's pointed out to the housing, problems that we've gotten and blah, blah, blah. I, I'm just making a plea here that we need to sort of get out there soon if we're thinking about this year and even some other date in the, in the following year. Um, <clears throat> so do we, is this to Michael, not to, to Jared, like what are our prospects for say, being able to say to people, we are, even though we're implementing one, phase one, we're already on phase two and beginning to think about holding our space for a serious sales tax. Because again, I, I really think the people in this community would support this if they really knew that it was going to like result in something that really made a difference, um, which I think we can offer them, given what we're talking about here. So what are your thoughts about when we sort of launch this to the public and start claiming a date or something? That's pretty concrete, is a question. Yeah. Um, so. It is uh, kind of a delicate dance with multiple partners and uh, trying to find the right partner, the right timing of the dance and so on. So I will tell you that um, phase two does require some participation by the university and it does require if you, to run it long term beyond a pilot project, it will require uh, an augmentation in funding. One of the options could be that ballot measure. Uh, it's been 
45 years since you've been on a ballot by yourself to make improvements with Metro. I think there's a lot of good resonating sound bites uh, in addition to a pilot that the, that the public could actually see, feel, and, and try that could motivate towards a successful ballot measure. We've done polling and, and obviously uh, have seen a lot of uh, strength in the number of folks that would be supportive of increasing uh, funding for Metro. Um, I will say that those who are looking for dancing partners and looking to uh, land on uh, a strategy and a year uh, all know that uh, we have been seriously considering November of 24. And I would say that just lots of discussions happening on a daily basis. And uh, I, I would assume that uh, the board's talking about it in the very near future because you're right, there's a lot of work that needs to be done if November of 24 was the date, uh, but there's also a lot of discussion on other dates as well as financial analysis of how we would fare going on a different date if, if that was the board's desire. Thank you. Other comments? Okay, I will take it out to the public and get comments from public on this. Eduardo Montesino, like I said, I'm more excited about the plan two, even the <laughs> or phase two, um, and because it's it provides a vision, a roadmap. You know, there's details to be worked out, but we'll get there. You know, it's the vision that we uh, that we got a, a plan in the community, the seed that is going to get us, you know, to a potential sales tax, to a, a you know to a, a renowned, robust systems that we've needed for a long time. You know, we've gone through the 12 A's, we've gone through the 91, so going all the way to UCSC. We've gone, you know, we lost a lot of ridership in UCSC staff doing the carpools. We've gone, you lost a lot of the farm workers, you know, because we cut service in Watsonville. So we've done a lot of these things. Um, so th this is, provides a roadmap, you know, to get us into the future, to get us, to get people, not only the people that use it all the time, but to get people on board. Because, you know, we're working on all, uh, on all these plans, all the cities and the county to not provide uh, um, enough space for parking, well, they need an option. And we are that option. So we got to provide th that vision and, and look forward to working with all of you and to provide this, uh, continue on this vision moving forward. Thank you. For me, I think, too, uh, after hearing the funding coming from UCSC and that's phase two and, like, what happens if that doesn't actually happen? Like, because phase three was Watsonville, 15-minute, you know, trips in Watsonville. is like, if phase two doesn't go through, like, what happens to phase three? Uh, that's some of my questions. Um, hopefully, you know, like, we could still get that amount of service in Watsonville. And uh, another kind of question I throw in there is like, the I know um, Metro mostly has the large buses. I seen some like smaller buses in Monterey, and I'm wondering like, uh, is it because like there are no as like wheelchair accessible, or has that like any of that uh, to reduce you know the the cost? Has that been looked into for? to provide more, um, to reduce cost in some areas. Thank you. I had a quick question. Um, so Metro, so this is a lot more frequency than Metro's ever done before, which is really exciting. But Metro doesn't currently have the operational policies needed to reliably operate frequent service like this. Things you'd see at other transit agencies, such as all door boarding to reduce dwell times, uh, or if you have two buses bunched up right back to back, the bus in front goes drop off only so it can you know, get ahead a little bit. Um, is Metro gonna be considering their operational policies in conjunction with the phase two process? So we don't typically do Q and A in this format, but you can pose your question and then when we come back to staff, I'll see if they can answer that. Thank you. Um, other public comments? Um, I really like the changes proposed in, one, in phase one and in phase two. I would just like to encourage everybody involved in <clears throat> the 
developing phase two to consider changes that would make the 35 more reliable um, as of right now and it, after it turns around like past Ben, ben Loman, it is almost always behind schedule. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, um, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ergo if he could come and speak to um, <coughs> two questions that were brought up around um, operational policies to operate at this frequency and then the other one was um, what if phase two doesn't happen and maybe that's um, uh, Michael Tree could respond to that. Sure. Uh, so we are actually considering all door boarding for phase one. We haven't made a final decision on that, but it's a discussion we've been having uh, perhaps just around the loop at the campus, perhaps uh, the entirety of the routes 18 and 19. So we are considering all door boarding uh, with phase one and we'll continue to develop uh, operational policies to d address bus bunching and reliability as we roll out phase two. In terms of what if phase two doesn't happen, so again, we'll, we're gonna jump into the details in October at the uh, finance committee meeting and, and beyond. Um, but the general idea is that phase two can be phased. So there are improvements that we can roll out uh, over time, assuming we have the operators and resources to do so. So it doesn't need to be an all-in-one package. Some of it does, you know, if we go forward with this idea of uh, introducing a break in the route at Cabrillo, that obviously has to come with the frequency on both sides to both Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Um, but other improvements, like the three and the two can come on uh, before, uh, just the three, I'll say. But anyway, phase two can be phased. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have anything to add, Michael? Okay. All right, and I know um, Director Lynch, you had a comment? Well, just a question on the question on smaller buses oh, and why. Did you respond? Yeah. Can I help with that one? Please. Um, we, we recently completed the very similar study for MST from Ottawa Salinas Transit, so we're very familiar with their smaller buses. Please remember that operating cost is mostly labor mm -hmm. and that the size of the bus does not have a very large effect on the operating cost at all. The primary reason to have smaller buses is to fit around tighter corners and difficult geometry. It's not because there's any cost savings to it. Uh, so keep that in mind. A, good tra a smart transit agency runs the largest bus it will ever need at any time during the course of the day, and, and, the, and the empty seats on the bus are not costing you anything. Mm -hmm. So it's better to have a bus that's too large than too small. One, Thank other, you. one other question. <clears throat> the, I hear from Boulder Creek, Ben Lohman, and, and um, some of the same concerns that were mentioned, that lack of reliability, and I'm, I'm understanding that phase one will address that. And obviously part of the problem is it's more rural and harder. I mean, in Scotts Valley, people say, well, you've got buses. I said, well, I don't have to walk from Granite Creek to Scotts Valley Drive. They don't come into my neighborhood. So it's not Boulder Creek or Ben Loman that's being, um, you know, receiving less service. But the question, I, or what I'm hearing, and I want to be able to take back that phase one will begin addressing the um, efficiency and shorter time frames. Phase one is a first step toward it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to promise that taking that little MLine deviation off is going to fix everything that's wrong with Route 35. It's a big long route, it has a lot going on. Phase three, which takes the Scotts Valley deviation off the route, starts to make a bigger difference toward making the route more useful. And uh, But ultimately, you know, Reliability is going to be a challenge. And of course, you know, access from some of the remote neighborhoods in the forest, we've had quite a bit of conversation in the course of the design workshop. We talked through all those neighborhoods from which various requests have come. And it often just comes down to visualizing the physical reality of what those neighborhoods are and what you would have to do in order to get closer to them. It becomes very hard to do efficiently. And even Highway 9 makes it challenging. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Just a, another issue of small buses is you have to keep a complete separate inventory of parts. If you have different, different, if you have, right, if you, instead of three kinds of buses, you've got 12 kinds of buses or something. So, yeah, especially as you head into this new hydrogen uh, future, you're going to want to minimize the diversity of your fleet. Definitely. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I don't, do we need a, yeah, so this goes, okay. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Walker, for um, being here today with us and for the presentation and all your work. And thank you all for the robust discussion.
You're here. Yeah. All right, we are on item 14, which is CEO oral report. All right. Well, I, uh, I'm just excited about today. I'm not gonna give you a lengthy list of good, bad, ugly that's going on behind the scenes because there's not a lot of good, uh, there's not a lot of bad or ugly. It, it just really continues to move forward in a positive direction. Really excited about uh, the, the uh, action items that you participated in today. Um, I, I would like to say just a special thanks for all of the public that visited our booth during the fair. It was just, uh, you know, on Sunday I was there for uh, all the afternoon and it just uh, was like 20 to 30 people constantly in line to learn about Metro, to spin the wheel and get a prize. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks came up and talked about employment with Metro. Mm. And uh, in particular, Anna Marie was there and just did like a masterful job of talking to them about, you know, the benefits of, of working with Metro, both for males and females. Um, I uh, wanted to just recognize the, the articulated buses from San Diego, the 15 that we needed and would like to run on the routes that are servicing the uh, university. There was a slight delay as New Flyer was having some supply issues in getting San Diego their new buses. So of course they wouldn't release the Arctics to us till their new buses came in. But the first three of the 15 came in this morning. They look great. They performed great from San Diego on into Santa Cruz. And uh, so we're hopeful that about three buses come in every week until we get to the 15. And so we're gonna turn them around, we're gonna get them on the service. You may still see some of the colors that uh, San Diego Transit uses on them until uh, Danielle gets a chance to uh, put the Metro uh, scheme on them and some one right at a time work on some of them. And so we're excited, That's it's all going in the right direction, but a hiccup in, in just timing and um, Yeah, you know what? I'm just excited to be here. I think that's the comment I'd give you we the most. We are too. My gosh, it's, uh, <laughs> this is really exciting. And I'm excited to see what the public thinks of phase two. And the uh, finance committee has some heavy lifts ahead of it, but it has options. And I really think doing a demonstration project, as soon as we have the drivers to be able to do phase two, will give the public uh, a year or two to really experience what this world-class uh, transit system can do for not only housing, but for congestion, for equity, and, and the whole list of uh, opportunities. The city and the county are very positive in discussions about transit signal priority for the 15-minute service so that the buses move through the intersections quickly, and that will be a, a key component. and. Uh, It'll be exciting to, to, to see how this all unfolds with phase two, and we think that we'll be back uh, in November at the latest uh, for an action item with phase two, just to kind of give you a preview and a timing okay. of that. So with that, I, I don't have any more comments. Thank you. Are there questions for um, from the board? Okay. Um, all right, so then item 15, our next meeting is Friday, October 27th at 9 a.m. at the Watsonville City Council Chambers. That's at 275 Main Street in Watsonville. And with that, I will adjourn our meeting. Thank you all for being here.